Um, sir, should we start? Six. We'll wait for some more time. Uh, one minute. 629 my mobile. One more minute. Okay, sir. And you, I think time is, yes. you can Sorry. start. Yes. Um, so good evening, teachers, senior colleagues, and dear postgraduates. My Praveen, on behalf of IAPM Kerala, in association with Mindre India, yeah, pleasure to welcome you all for our fifth consecutive online webinar session on lung, pleura, and media signal pathology. We are pleased to host the National Prominent Pathologist for this two-day webinar. This, this will serve to our next 91st chapter meeting, which is scheduled on Saturday, August 2023, where lung, pleura, and medicinal pathology is our slide seminar talk. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our distinguished speakers, Dr. Naik, consultant, consultant histopathologist, Department of Cellular Blackpool, Teaching Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust, England, UK. Rajiv Kaushal, Professor, Professor, Department of Pathology, Sachin, Mumbai. Dr. Triputi Pai, Associate Professor, Department of Pathology, Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Deepali Jain, Professor, Department, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. And Dr. Thomas Alec, Department of Pathology, CMC, Vellore. They'll be with us for this to share their vast knowledge and experience and at, the, at this time to extend my warm welcome to our distinguished moderators who have agreed to proceed over each session. Dr. Renu Mariam, Consultant, Department of Pathology, VPS Lakeshore Hospital. Dr. Morali, Professor and Head of Department of Pathology, Government Medical College. Dr. Lille Kuti Potin, Professor, Department of Pathology, Pushpakil Science, Tiruvella, Dr. Supriya, NK, uh, Professor and Head of Pathology, Government Medical College, and Dr. J. Lakshmi, PS, Professor, Department of Pathology, MES Medical College, Perindal Manna. I also like to thank the India team who, who are the backbone of this academic session. And I also like to thank and welcome uh, all of us, pathologists and practicing pathologists and post to be part of this program. Now I invite Dr. Raj, President, IAPM Kerala chapter, to give a presentation. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. It is indeed a very happy moment for us, IAP in Kerala chapter to host our fifth consecutive webinar. And uh, you know that uh, this time the topic is actually the lung pleura and mediation, excluding heart. Lung biopsies are routine. Routinely, uh, see, even a private pathologist in a lab is getting a lot of biopsies, lung biopsies as well as cytology. And uh, you know the WHO classification is also changing every every year or or uh, with the emergence of each WHO chapter and uh, we this time also we got the national best and an international faculty who is supposed to be the best in there in this concerned areas i'm not delaying the program so we can start the webinar this is the first day where we have three consecutive sessions. Second day also, the evening from the evening 6.30, we have three consecutive sessions. And uh, uh, Ani, you can introduce the first chairperson for the meeting.
no you are not audible thank you sir thank you sir without further delay we will start the first session of the day to introduce the speaker dr renu mariam thomas senior consultant department of pathology v hospital madam have done frc path and ccst in histopathology or pathologist she is the rc path country advisor for south india examiner for frc path examination madam has many publication under her Well, the chapters in gastrointestinal uh, pathology in clinical gastroenterology. Other a book, Atlas of Renal Transplant Pathology, a clinical pathological log. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Well, good evening, and thank you, Annie, for that kind introduction, and thank you, Rajan sir, for uh, offering me this privilege. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rajiv Kaushal, Professor and Pathologist, Tata Memorial Center. to deliver the first talk in this webinar series on neuroendocrine tumors of the lung neuroendocrine tumors are one of those fascinating group of tumors but the site specific terminologies and criteria one has to follow in classifying these tumors make it slightly confusing to the practicing pathologists as well as post graduates uh, so i feel this is a relevant topic to be discussed and thank you dr rajiv for agreeing to share your expertise in this field Dr Rajiv Kaushal received his medical degree from Grant Medical College Mumbai he completed his residency training in pathology at TMH Mumbai and PGI Chandigarh and joined TMH as faculty in 2012 his areas of interest are thoracic and gastrointestinal oncopathology molecular pathology and digital pathology he is a recipient of, of the Terry Fox Research Grant and Geraldine C Sailor Fellowship and he has many publications in national and international journals to his credit so on behalf of iapm kerala chapter i warmly welcome dr rajiv to provide some insight on this interesting topic over to you dr rajiv uh, thanks organizers and thanks for giving me this opportunity to share our experience uh, on the in the field of lung cancer and uh, uh, i am the opening batsman and uh, we are going to start the session with the uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the lung uh, can you see my slides and uh, you see uh, my slides are not moving so only your screen is visible yeah 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 so right yeah, now yeah yeah so so the spectrum of uh, all the uh, the neuroendocrine tumor is not uh, the one of the commonest tumor of the lung uh but they form the very important subset of 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 the lung tumor and uh, after the non small cell lung can cancer they are the the first uh, next common uh, tumor which is encountered in the lung but at the same time the spectrum of the neuroendocrine tumor is quite uh, wide and we can see the neuroendocrine morphology in uh, not only in the typically uh, described or characterized neuroendocrine tumors which include carcinoid uh, which has a typical and typical carcinoid or large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma and small cell so these are the four major subsets of of, of neuroendocrine tumors of the lung but at the same time uh, there are uh, you can uh, encounter some other tumors especially the non small cell car carcinomas uh, uh, which can be adeno or squamous or other uh, the large cell carcinoma which might show you neuroendocrine differentiation and you might be confused with in which diagnostic category we have to put uh, uh, this these tumors or are they really a neuroendocrine or uh, uh, or something else and there are some uh, some rare or uh, uncommon tumors which may express uh, some of the neuroendocrine markers so if you throw a neuroendocrine markers on a biopsy without taking into the consideration of the histo histomorphology you might fell into the trap because some of the other tumors might show you the neuroendocrine uh, tumors so what clinician expect from a pathologist when when we are dealing with a neuroendocrine neoplasm first and foremost important they need a precise and unbiased diagnosis which is based on histomorphology and supported by immunohistochemistry and uh, the grading of the tumor so it is not only the diagnosis but the grading of the tumor is, is of paramount importance because it that decides the which type of treatment the patient will will receive and the the, the characterization of these tumors need to be site specific and there is some attempt which is uh, made by the, the experts in the field of the neuroendocrine tumor to harmonize the nomenclature because uh, site wise it is you know, variable and uh, and if you see at many sites across uh, various organs 
now uh, a very uniform um, uh, nomenclature is being adopted that is well differentiated or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors and in that in the well, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor category either it is a, a G, grade 1 grade 2 or grade 3 and a neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma and uh, which has a, a small cell or and large cell histology but in still in lung uh, we are still following the, the old nomenclature that as that is a carcinoid in an atypical carcinoid it is not yet replaced in the uh, in the latest who classification although there was some attempt was made um, to and the grading like a, a neuro well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor grade 1 and grade 2 is although you can use it uh, you know, but still, as if you have to go as per the WHO you know, in, in the current, uh, as per the latest WHO, which was published in 2021, we have to use typical and atypical carcinoid and not uh, grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumor as it is recommended. Either you can use both the ones, but uh, uh, carcinoid tumors, it's not replaced. And one of the major reasons why the pulmonary pathologists are not um, uh, uh, ready to give up this uh, nomenclature, maybe uh, one is there, uh, they are uh, so much uh, uh, affectionate or uh, they don't want to leave this uh, terminology or want to have a unique uh, uh, place in the, uh, the new endocrine and new tumor. But the, uh, another important thing is uh, the, the carcinoid or atypical carcinoid, they don't form the major chunk of the uh, of neuroendocrine tumor, especially in, in the lung, as compared to in the other side, especially in the GI tract, where the, the dif well differentiated tumors, um, they form the larger chunk in the lung, the poorly differentiated one, they are, uh, they form the major uh, group of these tumors. So, if as uh, I mentioned uh, in the first slide, uh, we have when we are we, we diagnose a, a, a neuroendocrine tumor, the first and foremost uh, important thing is we have to pay uh, care, very careful attention towards the morphological features. So if you don't think about a, a tumor to be of a neuroendocrine differentiation, you will not uh, put up these markers and you are likely to miss these, these cases. And especially the well differentiated ones, they have very good clinical out outcomes. Uh, so you, you might miss, uh, uh, the patient might miss the opportunity of a very uh, specific th therapy and uh, which is a, like a complete cure for, for, for the patient despite uh, having a, a, a tumor. So morphological features, which is to be combined with the mitotic rate and of special attention we have to pay for the mitosis, my mitotic activity, mitosis and uh, presence or absence of necrosis because they form the very uh, crucial component in making a diagnosis and grading of the tumor. And the diagnosis has to be substantiated by the uh, support of the immunohistochemistry. Uh, chromogranin, cyanoprophycin, CD56, and uh, INSM1, which is the new, one of the new markers. These are the, the common markers which is being used to establish this uh, neuroendocrine differentiation. And KI-67, although it is being uh, commonly ordered, but it is not included in the diagnostic uh, criteria as compared to other sites um, other than lung. So let's start with the first uh, diagnostic criteria that is a car carcinoid uh, tumor. So as we all know that the, in lung, the carcinoid tumors are categorized into the typical and atypical. And these are the diagnostic category uh, criteria. Uh, to identify and categorize them. So mitosis, if the tumor which shows neuroendocrine morphology, but mitosis is less than two per uh, two millimeters um, square area, and if there is no necrosis and its size is more than uh, five millimeter, it is uh, typical carcinoid. But if the mitosis cross the the cutoff of two, uh, but is not more than ten, and if there is a presence of necrosis, uh, it becomes a atypical carcinoid. So these are the few examples of the, the uh, atyp uh, typical carc carcinoid tumors, uh, uh, both typical and atypical on low power may look uh, similar. And many of them, they present as an endobronchial uh, mass, as you can see in, uh, in this picture. So it can present as an endobronchial uh, lesion. And uh, overlying mucosa can uh, sometimes it can be ulcerated. So uh, and there is a spe uh, especially on the small uh, biopsies. Uh, sometimes you get uh, you might get the reactive uh, squamous metaplasia of the overlying epithelium, and there's a the tumor which is sitting uh, uh, below it, and uh, which is a differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. So we have to pay a very careful attention, uh, especially in the endobronchial lesions, which are. Uh, and on biopsy samples, you can misinterpret that as a uh, something else. 
the various histological patterns can be observed, uh, like uh, organoids, rosetting, spindling, trabecular, and these are the uh, some of the other other common histological variants of the neuroendocrine tumors which you can uh, come across. There are some rare variants also. Uh, you, you should be uh, you should keep in mind, uh, like uh, there are pigmented variant, clear cell variants. And uh, sometimes you might get a, a calcification and ossification is in these two cats. So ossification is one of the the common. Uh, this is one of the tumor which might show you the the ossification or the bone formation in 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 the lung because it might be sitting there from a from a very long uh, long time. So um, although there are very characteristic morphological features, but you have to keep in mind um, the other rare variants as well. Uh, the metastasis in typical carcinoid, if you say, uh, if typical carcinoid uh, don't metastasize, that is not true. Even if it is a well differentiated uh, grade one tumor, uh, their isolated mets can be observed uh, in, in these, uh, these cases. Uh, the careful attention when we have to distinguish between a typical and atypical carcinoid should be given to the to the uh, the presence or absence of mitosis. So mitosis becomes uh, so evaluation of mitosis becomes very crucial when you are dealing with the, uh, these tumors. And if you see any focus of necrosis, uh, that is a, a obvious clear cut necrosis. And many times you might uh, see such type of a punctate. Necrosis in uh, in a typical carcinoid means oh, whole of the area looks uh, completely bland and there can be some isolated foci of these necrosis. Uh, these are the, uh, the diagnostic criteria to label it for a typical carcinoid. Next uh, problems occur uh, when in identifying the true or true mitosis uh, because uh, sometimes there can be a pycnosis or apoptosis so the you might confuse these things uh, with with a with a mitosis and upgrade the the tumor so uh, what criteria you have to keep in mind uh, when you are evaluating a true mitosis usually mitosis uh, there is a, in a mitotic, mitosis as as compared to the this picture which is illustrated here it is apoptosis there is a absence of the nuclear membrane so you will see just on only the nuclear fragments uh, without any, there is a no clear zone, but uh, apoptosis might give you the, some clear zone and uh, presence of hairy uh, like processes uh, that uh, that are uh, with the basophilic tinge rather than the orangeophilic tinge, which you can see uh, on this image, there is a pink uh, appearance. Uh, as, so that, those are the features which help you to distinguish between the mitosis and the apoptosis or the so next comes after your morphological diagnosis is made, on the, you have to throw the markers, ISC markers, synaptophysin, chromogranin. These are the markers which are commonly being used. And, uh, but you have to keep in mind, uh, if you should not rely only on one marker, because in, a one, in any particular case, one marker can be negative, another may, may be positive, even in the differentiated tumors. So we have to at least uh, uh, do two markers to establish your diagnosis. Next comes the role of uh, KI-67. Is it uh, mandatory? It is not mandatory, um, but uh, if, we, if we have to see, see uh, distinguish a dif differentiated uh, from a high, uh, uh, high grade tumor, especially in the core biopsy, it might help. And usually typical uh, carcinoids, they have low, uh, low proliferation, and but it can uh, go as high as up to the 30%, which I will discuss um, uh, further. So this was about the typical and atypical carcinoid. Next diagnostic category is a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, these are, uh, this is cor uh, corresponding to the, to, to the poorly differentiated one. And so, so large cell, when we, you will label it a tumor as a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, the, at least the size of, of the nucleus should be at least three times. So that, the, that diagnostic criteria you have to keep in mind. And this is very important, especially there can be some cases where you are uh, you will be struggling with whether to call this case as a large cell neuroendocrine or, or a typical carcinoid, especially in the small biopsies. So other diagnostic criteria are uh, mitotic count, if it is more than 10 per uh, uh, 2 mm square. Uh, so earlier we used to use uh, 10 high power field. So it is recommended now um, not to use the, the 10 high power field, but uh, the area of your uh, microscope, uh, microscope lens need to be evaluated. And in addition, uh, these are the few 
uh, just to show the few uh, uh, illustrations of how does a large cell neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma will look it, it can show the similar growth pattern as as that of a, a typical carcinoma means it can be a trabecular or nested arrangement but uh, the mitosis uh, necrosis is more uh, obvious now there is a, the mitosis and, and apoptosis is also more clearly evident in these ca these cases and as i mentioned the size of the of the cell you have to pay a close attention to it and finally the for the confirmation of this diagnosis you need uh, to show the expression of neuroendocrine markers and absence of the either the squamous markers uh, in that one another thing you have to keep in mind usually the the typical and atypical carcinoid they are either negative or show the weak positivity for the for TTF1, but at the same time, small cell and large cell carcinomas, they, sh they, they can show the strong expression for the, for the TTF1. So TTF1 should not be used as a marker to distinguish between uh, adenocarcinoma and the neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, they usually show the high proliferation index. Uh, you might encounter sometimes the very large bizarre cells. Uh, so, uh, cell, and uh, again, you are confused whether to label this particular case as a, a small cell or large cell. So, attention has to pay to the to the size and the nuclear ATP, and at the same, also look for the mitosis and the necrosis in the background. So, uh, there are four case scenarios which you might come across, uh, which can show you the large cells. Um, uh, uh, with the possible neuroendocrine phenotypes. And um, so we have, we were offering a diagnosis of a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. Just keep these four uh, diagno differential diagnoses in your mind. Uh, first is a, like a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. That is a true uh, car uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma in which you should see the new, uh, new uh, histomorphological features on light microscopy, which is supported by ISC or by electron microscopy. The other difference is a large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine morphology means you, you, you suspect it to be neuroendocrine on a histomorphology, but uh, ISC failed to, to establish the diagnosis. So uh, in this case, in, in this uh, scenario, especially on the bio, small biopsy tissue, you can give a rider uh, uh, in, in your report, although uh, uh, especially on the small biopsy, although the neuroendocrine differentiation was suspected, it could not be established on the by immunohistochemistry. Another diagnostic category is a large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, these are the, uh, the, also the cases where uh, both, uh, uh, although they are large cell, but, uh, uh, but the neuroendocrine differentiation uh, is not there both on histology as well as on the, uh, but on ISC, uh, they can show the apparent expression. So you might come across some cases of uh, uh, adenocarcinoma or squamous carcinoma with the focal expression of, the, of these uh, markers. Uh, and you have to be careful uh, in these cases. And last is about the classical large cell carcinoma, which usually lacks both morphological evidence as well as the neuroendocrine uh, differentiation on the special strain. So non-small cell uh, uh, carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation uh, it is recommended to perform the neuroendocrine marker special or only when when you we strongly suspect the neuroendocrine morphology. Otherwise, you might fall in trap. Uh, the moving to the last diagnostic category that is a small cell carcinoma. Uh, as the name applies, uh, this the, the cells they are very tightly packed and they they are uh, they looks like a small cell, uh, uh, but they are definitely larger than the size of the lymphocytes. They they may show the crushing artic crushing uh, nuclear molding uh, and, and other histomorphological features uh, of a neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumor in which is supported by the isc for uh, cytokeratin as well as the neuroendocrine differentiation the point to be remembered especially when uh, you are making a diagnosis of large cell uh, small cell carcinoma uh, they can be either uh, show the weak expression for the cytokeratin so if uh, if a case is negative for uh, a negative or uh, uh, on low power, if you feel it is a negative for cytokeratin, uh, try to double cross, uh, 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 double check uh, the case on the high, higher magnification because there can be some uh, focal expression for cytokeratin, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, at, uh, which can be very focal and very subtle. So we have to keep it, keep that thing in mind, and uh, always try if your your neuroendocrine markers uh, do not work. In those cases, you should uh, try to exclude the other differentials of a, a sm uh, of small cell morphology, like a lymphomas or other round cell tumor that should be excluded in mind. Uh, 
uh, uh, some rare variants uh, like a combined small cell carcinoma when you see the combination of both adenocarcinoma uh, like in first case we have shown uh, there is a nice glands and there is a neuroendocrine tumor sitting uh, ne just next to it and another case of squamous carcinoma with the neuroendocrine differential uh, focus so uh, it is recommended that uh, both the components should be at least uh, 10% uh, but uh, it, it, on sp small biopsy it is uh, it may or may not uh, hold true and if you see any type of neuroendocrine differentiation it, it it is recommended to report that um, uh, uh, report that and document that another thing which you have to keep in mind as we see uh, now now lot of patients uh, 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 of lung cancer they undergo for uh, they undergo molecular testing and in these cases we have to uh, so if the case is EGF for positive and on uh, progression if shows a small cell differentiation that means it is a small cell transformation in a case of uh, EGFR and that is one of the reason for the TKI resistance in that case. Now uh, let's discuss some of the uh, problematic issues uh, of the neuroendocrine tumors, uh, uh, which we can, uh, although ISC, as I said, is, is required for the making a diagnosis, but ISC uh, patterns can be variable, even uh, both in differentiated and as well as in the poorly differentiated tumors. Uh, the neuroendocrine, that's why you need more number of markers. So uh, the using only one marker or like a only synapto or only chromo may, may or may not help like uh, this case, which is strongly positive for synaptophysin, but chromogranin was negative. Uh, use of cytogratin, as I mentioned, you have to use, uh, you, use it very uh, 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 pay special attention for the for cytokeratin, especially in the in the poorly differentiated or small cell carcinoma because they can be very uh, keratin shy or very uh, keratin can be very weak. Uh, if your neuroendocrine markers uh, like synaptochromo both uh, or any other markers uh, fail to uh, show the expression, in those cases try to do the TTF1 because uh, TTF1 is, as I mentioned earlier, is not a marker for the for the only for the adenocarcinoma differentiation, but the high grade neuroendocrine carcinomas they also ex express the TTF, and so you can use this as a one of the su surrogate markers. So, uh, based on histomorphology, we uh, although there are four uh, four uh, different categories: uh, typical carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, and small cell and large cell uh, carcinoma. But uh, from the from the clinician perspective, uh, uh, the, low, the, the it is a like a three tier, -tier system. So we have to keep in mind. Uh, distinguishing if if especially on the small biopsy, if you are not able to distinguish between high, uh, small cell and large cell, it doesn't make a make much difference. But distribution between the low grade uh, uh, entities from the high grade is is uh, uh, much uh, much more relevant. Now uh, let's uh, there are some the the problem common issues which uh, are encountered in the in, in neuroendocrine tumors is. Uh, uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, uh, you have to pay uh, the careful uh, attention for for to the uh, to the histomorphology as well as ISC features. Uh, typical and atypical carcinoids uh, cannot be distinguished many times, especially on the small uh, small biopsies. And uh, we you we have to pay a close uh, attention towards the mit presence of mit mitosis and and necrosis. Uh, another important thing, there are some issues with the grading of the tumor and uh, uh, and uh, towards the end, I will briefly touch upon the emerging mo molecular biomarkers in neuroendocrine tumors. So these are the common problems, uh, problematic area, distinction between typical versus atypical carcinoid, atypical versus large cell, or if it is a large cell uh, versus a, a small cell carcinoma. So these are the three uh, common problems which you encountered when you are dealing. And uh, recent WHO, especially for to, uh, to ease our uh, life, uh, especially with the distinction between uh, uh, if the distinction between typical and atypical carcinoid is not possible, uh, especially in the three scenar scenarios, especially if it is a small biopsy or cytology specimens where you are not certain about the mitotic count and the necrosis. Uh, in, in case of metastatic carcinoids and where only you have very limited uh, material for the review. In such cases, you can use the term carcinoid NOS rather than uh, specifying it is a typical or atypical carcinoid. In such cases, you can take a help of KI67, but it is not, not mandatory. So especially in the small biopsy specimens, uh, if you are not able to characterize it, it's better to use the terminology carcinoid NOS. 
next is about the problems uh, which we face is about the uh, uh, about the evaluation of the mitosis so mitosis uh, there are uh, set recommendations uh, uh, which is provided for counting the mitosis first and foremost important you have to uh, evaluate the whole sections and uh, if there are multiple sections uh, evaluate them uh, also because neuroendocrine tumors are known for their heterogeneity and there can be some isolated uh, small hotspot foci where uh, the mitotic count is uh, might be very high uh, so you have to pay attention to these uh, these uh, these foci. Uh, the counting of mitosis as I mentioned earlier, it is not per as per ten high power field. It is as per two mm square area. And uh, there is a guide also uh, how to calculate the the field area of your your microscope. And uh, so if you uh, if, if you uh, see, see the WHO uh, WHO of lung tumors uh, the, in the very beginning um, in the very few few pages they have given this very nice table uh, from where you can measure your field diameter and field diameter uh, uh, either it is mentioned on your microscope or if uh, still there is a doubt, doubt you can contact contact your uh, vendor for the respective microscope and ask them which, what is the field diameter of my uh, microscope and you can keep it very handy so that you have an idea uh, how many fields you have to count uh, uh, when you are evaluating the uh, uh, evaluating a new special uh, the mitosis and k67 in a neuroendocrine tumor next is a uh, role of k67 okay so uh, as i mentioned k67 is not mandate uh, mandatory marker for the neuroendocrine carcinoma diagnosis but some scenario it really helps uh, especially if the, your tissue is very crushed uh, and you are not uh, sure about the uh, categorizing whether it is a, a low grade or high grade tumors although so th these two biopsy samples uh, they are very limited samples and they look exactly similar uh, but if you throw a ka 67 or MIB one so first one is showing uh, hardly any uh, proliferation of one to two percent but the other one all the cells are lit up so th that means at least even in the limited samples you can uh, raise the possibility that you are dealing with a high grade tumor not a uh, low grade uh, uh, carcinoid tumor and uh, as i as expected that uh, uh, typical carcinoid they will they have a low typical and atypical uh, have low k67 as compared to the uh, small cell and large cell uh, carcinoma so but what are the what is, what is the consensus about the cutoffs so it is recommended if a tumor is uh, has a k67 of more than 5 it is likely to be atypical uh, but uh, these these are yet not uh, established recommendations. So uh, you must have uh, noted that as compared to the GI tumors, where the cutoff is is more than three percent, um, it is kept slightly on the higher side. But it is also it is only based on some uh, on the experience of uh, people, and there is no consensus has been reached on this uh, cutoff value. But it is regarded as if it is a tumor is more than five, it is likely to be atypical. And if the K67 is more than 30, it is likely to be large cell uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma or small cell uh, carcinoma rather than uh, atypical uh, carcinoid. So next uh, problems ka occur is the how to measure the K67. So K67, uh, although it appears very simple, uh, the number of positive cells divided by the total number of, of, of tumor cell nuclei. Uh, multiplied by 100. But when we are using it for the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors, especially you have to evaluate at least 500 cells on biopsy samples and 2000 cells on the resection specimen. So let's uh, discuss some of the key issues which you can come across um, with the KA67. So uh, how KA67 is different from mitosis? Um, so KA67 uh, uh, is can is expressed in the cells during all phases of uh, cell cycles as compared to the mitosis which is or represents only the m phase and uh, it is uh, usually it is presumed that ki67 uh, is usually higher as compared to the uh, to the mitotic count and the reason for that is because it reflects the proliferation across all the, the cycles of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, all phases of cell cycle uh, now the problems uh, of the K67s can be variable, and the one of the most uh, common problem which um, which can alter the K67 is the adequate fixation and the grossing of the of the specimens. It also depends on the which type of clone you are using, and uh, so there that that is the reason that uh, of the variability among the K67 across the various labs. Uh, so is it? 
a reliable marker for the diagnosis or uh, or prognosis in the lung cancer uh, the, the data till uh, till date has not shown it's as a diagnostic uh, role as well as the uh, predictive role uh, but it, it is uh, presumed that the tumor which has a high uh, uh, ki67 they are likely to behave uh, in, in not in a, a good manner so ki67 uh, as uh, just to again emphasize it is not used as a definitive criteria in classification of neuroendocrine tumor as it is used in the gi tumors and um, it is not a, a better pre a predictor than mitosis so still date on um, mitosis is used as a diagnostic criteria not on uh, the ki67 and another problem with the ki67 which you have to keep in mind that there can be some hot spot areas and the evaluation of the ki67 can be uh, challenging so uh, when you are evaluating the ki67 we have to pay attention to these hot spot areas as well as to the uh, uh, average count and so the ki67 assessment has a limitation because of uh, it can be challenging and the, what are the ideal method to uh, report or do the uh, for the reporting of ki67 uh, first is adequate number of cells as i mentioned earlier uh, 500 cells for biopsy and 2000 for the uh, for the resection specimen and the com these are the com three common methods which are being used for assessment of ki67 uh, the eyeballing is the most commonly most of the pathologists they use they they keep they uh, give their a uh, calculated uh, judgment uh, based on the uh, when the slide is placed under the microscope uh, but it is recommended that um, that is not that might not be the correct method and the what is recommended as a as a gold standard is a counting uh, manual cell counting either on the captured or the printed images uh, but uh, it has its own uh, practical challenges and the solution to that is a digital image analysis using the digital various uh, ki67 quantification uh, software so this is how uh, we have if you have to count it manually you, you have to keep either a snapshot of of the image or uh, I, uh, either on the computer or, or or take a print of it and count each and every cells and uh, finally give the ki67 so it can be very laborious and uh, it can be time consuming so you in all cases you don't have to do this uh, in which scenarios uh, where you are your ki67 is just is very close to the uh, cut off uh, in those cases it is it might be relevant and um, where uh, uh, the clinicians it makes a real difference in in, in the tree patient treatment in those scenario it is re uh, relevant so the, the assistance to that has come from the digital path pathology and ai tools and so this is a, one of the uh, ai tool which can pick up all the brown staining uh, brown staining cells and give you a score depend uh, depending on the intensities but at the same time we have to keep in mind ki67 um, evaluation it is not the your algorithm should not only pick up the the dark staining cells as you can see there are there is a variable staining here there are some cells are very dark some are lighter in shape so the algorithm should be able to pick up all these things and not do uh, even uh, uh, false give you false count on that so uh, there are some softwares which gives you uh, uh, you can further validate or you can pick and choose which cells to really uh, count or or delete it and after the initial training of these softwares, um, the, uh, for each and every case, you don't have to go and count uh, and uh, really uh, check. So you can really rely on these software once your standardization and validation of them is, is done, especially uh, uh, the, the software should not pick up any false positive and as, as, as well as should not miss any weak uh, positive cells. Another uh, uh, some concerns about when you are using these AI based softwares, uh, there can be some uh, brown staining in like here is shown in the in the stromal cells, which is not part of, of the tumor. So in, in the, these cases, the assistance um, of from the pathologist is required. So it means a pathologist has to take a call, which which is the true uh, uh, K67 expression versus the expression in the surrounding uh, surrounding cells. So as it is shown by the red arrows, those are the true 
ks 67 which need to be counted rather than the the the, the green circles which are in the stroma which need to be ignored so uh, so to answer uh, another problem uh, which uh, sometimes these algorithms can do uh, if you are evaluating a ka67 on a metastatic node uh, where the the lymphoid focus might show a high expression so uh, the, the, because the software should allow you to select the region of interest uh, especially if you because ka67 uh, can if the algorithm, algorithm don't know itself if whether you are if you are asking the expression in a tumor or in the in the surrounding area so you have when you are using these algorithms you have to keep in mind that you are not should not be counting the non neoplastic cells like the lymphocytes or any other brown pigment which can be there in the in in the tissue which might give you the false positive or false negative results another uh, 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 another concern which was addressed in the latest WHO uh, classification is about the carcinoid tumors with the elevated mitotic count. So you you might come across some cases in which the, the morphology it looks like a, a, a typical uh, atypical carcinoid, but the mitotic count is high. Even KS67 is uh, is high. So whether to label these tumors as uh, large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas or uh, are they equivalent to the grade three neuroendocrine tumors of uh, uh, intestine or, or, or pancreas? It is all, uh, yet not established, but there is, is a good amount of uh, publications coming in to address uh, this issue uh, as well. Uh, but uh, the, based on the experience of the of, of the this limited studies which are published, uh, it was been found, found that these tumors molecularly they don't fit uh, 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 goes along with the large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, which use uh, as they most of them they lack uh, uh, retinoblastoma and p53 mutation. Hence, it is supported to classify them as a typical carcinoid uh, till date. But you have to make a comment on your report that this tumor is showing high uh, proliferation uh, as well as the mitotic count, despite being a differentiated tumor and likely to behave uh, in an aggressive uh, manner. So brief to, uh, towards the end, I'd like to briefly touch upon the molecular profiling. Uh, uh, as you know that uh, uh, in every field, uh, there is an extensive role of the molecular testing and, and biomarker testing. So. Uh, now, the uh, earlier there was very limited uh, uh, cases were subjected uh, for any molecular testing uh, in the for the neuroendocrine uh, tumors. Uh, but it it uh, the, with the recent publications or the experience of the some authors, they have uh, found uh, that uh, even the differentiated uh, tumors that is a typical and atypical carcinoid they can be categorized into the three uh, broad uh, broad categories. Uh, like a atypical carcinoid usually uh, have a men one uh, mutations and uh, so these uh, molecular classification may uh, uh, till date they don't have any practical uh, implication especially for the carcinoid tumors but if you're really struck then uh, you might take the help of uh, these these issues uh, large cell neuroendocrine um, uh, neuroendocrine cancers it has been proposed that they are uh, also uh, categorized into the two broad groups uh, one uh, which is which behave like a small cell and another group which behaves like a non small cell uh, cell carcinoma so uh, molecular subtyping of large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma it is uh, also into the two subgroups which is in which uh, non small cell type uh, uh, which may behave like a uh, adenocarcinomas or uh, they might show the p53 stk and other alt uh, alteration but has a neuroendocrine uh, phenotype and uh, the small cell uh, like like phenotype they show the loss of uh, uh, retinoblastoma and p53 similar to the small cell cell carcinomas and these tumors may should be, be should be treated like a small cell uh, carcinoma and towards the end uh, about the small cell as we know that they are mo they, most of them they show the p53 uh, uh, mutation and uh, RB uh, loss of RB, but uh, the other targeted alteration which are uh, described in in, in the uh, non-small cell carcinoma they are not documented, and uh, this is now very very uh, 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 interesting thing which is coming up. Uh, the small cell cancer, small cell lung carcinomas, they are now being histologic uh, uh, molecularly categorized into the four uh, broad groups uh, based on the based on whether they show the expression for the neuroendocrine markers or, or not. So uh, they, they, these groups are like uh, ASL, 
one and neuro d uh, they they are the tumors which usually show the the high uh, expression for the neuroendocrine marker so if you come across it a, a small a tumor which has small cell like uh, morphology uh, and express uh, the neuroendocrine markers quite well then it is likely to be from the top two group that is ascl1 or 2 or neuro d group uh, but if the tumor shows the weak expression or the absence of the neuroendocrine markers, then it is likely to be from the POW or YAP1 uh, group. And uh, the, the further interesting thing is that for these molecular uh, markers, uh, now the immunohistochemistry markers are also available. So it, it, it might be very easy for us uh, to identify this. And uh, why this uh, categorization is important because there are different uh, th therapeutic targets. Uh, so as we used to do it for the adenocarcinoma, so now maybe in future, we have all, we also need to categorize the, even the small cell carcinoma into these four uh, broad groups because there are different uh, established uh, therapeutic options are available for uh, to the clinician. So to summarize, uh, this is the uh, snapshot of the classification of neuroendocrine tumor as per the latest uh, WHO classification. And uh, although there are no ma major changes were done as compared to the previous classifications, uh, the, uh, and we still have to go with the uh, diagnostic categories of typical and atypical carcinoid. If you wish, you can put these uh, neuroendocrine grade one or grade two, uh, but it is not um, uh, mandatory. And uh, uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas, uh, uh, the broadly they are of small cell and large cell, uh, cell, cell type. And we have to now get familiarized with the uh, evolving molecular classification. So uh, in maybe in future, we have to categorize small cell carcinomas into the, uh, the various, these four subtypes and uh, as uh, various tools, both molecular wise, as well as by the immunohistochemistry are available uh, to us. So this, with this, I conclude my talk by saying that uh, neuroendocrine tumors are called as a zebras of oncology because they are very heterogeneous and they can be very confusing both for his, uh, both for the for the pathologist to make a diagnosis and also for the for the clinicians uh, uh, when they want to make a, a decision for their for their treatment so with this i end my talk and if there are any questions i will be more than happy to take them Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for that detailed coverage on various aspects of entities of the lung. And uh, thank you so much for highlighting those problem areas which we may come across in our daily practice. Uh, now, Q&A, there are a few questions. Um, and one, do we call it NET or classify as carcinoid, small and large cell? So, uh as compared to, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, in lung we are we are, we still follow the the diagnostic uh, uh, category four broad diagnostic categories. That is a typical atypical uh, carcinoid or last small cell and large cell cell carcinomas. So although NET connotes uh, to the typical and atypical carcinoid. Uh, it's better to use the specific diagnostic criteria as uh, uh, categories as, as recommended by WHO rather than putting it broadly as NETs. Okay, the, another question is, do we have to do NAPS in A uh, for confirmation of adenocarcinoma? It is not mandatory, but if uh, there can be some cases where, especially the large cell, uh, large cell or carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation, where, where you are confused whether it is a adenocarcinoma which is showing focal ex expression or not. So in those cases, napsin uh, might help you uh, because TTF1 uh, will come diffusely positive in in all the cells. Okay, whether it is a neuroendocrine component or adenocarcinoma component, uh, in those scenarios, napsin uh, can help. Uh, so if you're uh, stuck with between that, those, um, I, I also sometimes order the uh, napsin. And uh, another thing which you can ask your clinicians to check for the uh, serum CA level. So if serum CA levels are raised, uh, then it also give a, uh, give a hint that this tube has the adenocarcinoma component associated with it. So napsin A does not always mean it's a combined carcinoma, isn't it? 
no it it doesn't mean uh, it is a combined carcinoma it but it it, it uh, if napsin is positive that means there is a adeno component so it can be a, just a neuro uh, adeno carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation also so for combined carcinoma you need to have a distinct areas uh, of uh, adeno carcinoma or or a small cell or uh, or a neuroendocrine okay. there, there, there has to be distinct area it, it should not be like a, uh, a continuity with each other so thank you um another question is how do we sign out a report which looks morphologically like small cell carcinoma but negative for synaptopycin and chromogranin ttf1 weekly positive yeah so this is uh, this can be a really uh, tricky uh, problem so first and foremost we have to take help of the additional uh, neuroendocrine markers like uh, nsm1 or cd56 if it is possible uh do uh, always in such cases do cytokeratin to establish that this is really of a uh, uh, of a carcinoma uh, epithelial origin uh, because if you don't do a cytokeratin and th there can be some cases uh, which uh, which can be lymphoma or other small cell tumors which you might miss the question uh, and, uh, she has very specifically uh, asked if the ttf1 is weak positive so neuroendocrine small cell carcinomas they are known uh, especially the powd and uh, the, the molecular two molecular subtypes which i mentioned they can be uh, show the weak expression for them so in such cases you have to uh, try first try your put your best effort and even if after that you are not uh, able to resolve put it a uh, you can sign it uh, especially on the small biopsy as a poly differentiated carcinoma in a comment you can put uh, that morphologically the uh, the possibility of small cell carcinoma was considered, but ISC could not substantiate the diagnosis. So this is how uh, we put a rider in our reports. Okay, thank you. Um, someone is asking whether you can mention about carcinoid tumulates. So uh, you have to uh, measure the size. Uh, if it is less than uh, uh, 5 millimeter, then only use that category. Role of pdl one in lung cancer. Yeah, so role of PDL1 is coming up in uh, all the cancers, uh, and uh, clinicians are asking. So, you, especially pertaining to the neuroendocrine tumors, uh, usually uh, uh, the request will hardly come for the differentiated one, like uh, uh, for the typical and atypical carcinoid. But uh, sometimes we do get a request, uh, especially for the uh, in small cell, when the all the therapeutic options are exhausted and the patient is uh, or patient is not responding to conventional uh, th uh, therapies okay thank you um uh, what terminology will you use in cytology smear in an in a case of net grade 2 versus small cell carcinoma in cytology yeah so uh, in cytology basically you have to uh, first and foremost important thing we have to rely on the uh, cytomorphological features uh, is it a differentiated tumor versus a uh, uh, undifferentiated or the tumor has a small cell morphology uh, if possible if you can see the mitosis uh, uh, because it is not possible to quantify the mitosis uh, so it, the grading can be uh, can be tricky so uh, the clue to it, if it, in the background if you are seeing necrosis and lot of apoptosis and mitosis it is likely to be small cell rather than uh, uh, a, a typical carcinoid. Thank you. Um, it's another question. Is there a difference in management when we report large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation and large cell carcinoma with neuroendocrine morphology? Yeah, so neuroendocrine morphology means on, uh, on uh, histomorphology, you suspect uh, that this tumor has a neuroendocrine differentiation, but it was not established. So cisplatin uh, is added only if you establish the, uh, uh, the neuroendocrine differentiation. Otherwise, uh, uh, they will not add, add the cisplatin to the regime. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, you mentioned about CMCEA. Dr. Bindu is asking whether you can explain more about that. Can you, uh, can you repeat your question? CMCEA. Okay. So if uh, you are stuck with uh, some situation where on morphology and also based on uh, the various markers, you are not able to re reach out whether it is a combined carcinoma or adenocarcinoma with the neuroendocrine differentiation. So in these cases, uh, you can go back 
uh, to the clinicians because if it is a pure neuroendocrine carcinoma it uh, the serum ca will be normal uh, but if it it has adeno component the serum ca might be be elevated so it it will help only if it is it has a elevated value if it is a normal value it will not help you uh, but sometimes uh, uh, if it it really help the uh, and to give you a, a conclusive diagnosis and you can guide the treatment uh, if the serum ca is is raised so that means uh, your neuroendocrine differentiation is associated uh, with the adenocarcinoma and not purely it is not a pure large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma okay thank you um Dr. Ritu would like to know, is there a role, any role of NSC nowadays? We hardly do it. I, I think okay. uh, we have. It's really not specific, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Malini is asking, how do you report a tumor that looks like carcinoid morphologically, but with a KI index of 20% or more? I think you covered that in your uh, presentation. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So there is a diagnostic... Uh, category uh, which uh, criteria which is proposed uh, although it is not has been uh, really established uh, so i will just put it again for the benefit so uh, so th these are the scenarios in which uh, uh, which which diagnostic category to uh, to to be used so in this situation w as per who they say you should put a note that there is a histological features are uh, are that of a carcinoid uh, and you should mention about the mitosis and these tumors are like likely to behave in a more aggressive uh, aggressive manner so uh, there is clarity is not yet there uh, on on this diagnostic category because the number of cases are are uh, also low and maybe by next who we will get a more clear picture uh, or maybe if at least uh, i also feel in in lung also we need the three tire system where uh, we should. There should be a place for NET grade three tumors. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, do you use the term large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma with uh, 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 morphology, carcinoid morphology? Do you use any terminology like that in those cases when the uh, morphologically it looks like carcinoid, and when there is a K sixty seven which is high? No, so morphologically, these uh, tumors are uh, still a carcinoid tumor. So, so you can't label them as a as a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And uh, based on the limited experience uh, of the authors uh, using uh, they on molecular wise also, they have they are most of them were uh, not showing the loss of uh, 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 retinoblastoma or p53. So even the molecular wise, it was still they are supported to uh, supposed to be carcinoid tumors. Um, okay, these are the main questions. Can I just ask you one question? Is there a role of P53 in differentiating between carcinoid and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma like we follow in pancreas? Yeah, it has some role, uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, even uh, I'll just project this uh, slide again. So there are, uh, there are two uh, broad categories. One one uh, so both there can be inactivation of the p53 and R, R, rb gene so uh, especially if you want to differentiate between carcinoid versus large cell it may may help uh, but it is not very 100% uh, specific uh, so uh, uh, there are some um, uh, senior professor they also recommend if you are uh, rather than p53 rely more on the uh, rb retinoblast uh, rb loss of rb because that can give you more uh, precise picture rather than uh, using p53 but it has a, a role because usually carcinoid tumors they uh, they are wild type for p53 whereas large cell and small cell carcinoma they are usually mutated for p53 okay thank you um can, is there amphicrine carcinoma in the lung like in GIT? Yeah, so you can get, a, although they are very, very rare and most of the problem in the lung is we rarely get uh, uh, resections uh, for the, especially for the large uh, 
uh, for the high grade tumors so that is the main problem uh, in the lung because they are more aggressive and uh, uh, most of the experience was uh, was either from the autopsy studies or uh, based on that so th that is a limitation uh, which we have uh, but uh, definitely you can uh, come across all sort of combinations so it is not only unique to the gi tract only Okay, thank you. Any, uh, shall we wind up now? or? Yes, ma'am. I think it's time. Uh, sir, if it's not, you can actually answer it online if it's not okay. You can type it in your answers if you have. Okay. okay. I, I, so once I, I, again, I, thank you, Dr. Raji, for accepting our invitation and enlightening us on this interesting topic. Thank you. We've got one more session. Okay. After this second one. Okay. Uh, so thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Rajiv, sir. So we're moving on to the second talk. To introduce the speaker, I welcome Dr. Shamim K. Umar Ali. Madam have completed her MBBS and MD from Government Medical College, Kottayam, and joined service at Government Medical College, Kottayam, in 1996. She worked in uh, Government Medical College, Trishur, um, Alapi, and Government Medical College, Ernagulam. Cur currently, she's working as a professor and head of pathology at Government Medical College, Trishur. Over to you, ma'am. Shami? Hello? Shami, please unmute. Okay, right. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. I thank office bearers of the IAPM for giving me this opportunity. Uh, mediastinal lesions uh, are very diverse and often present a diagnostic challenge to the pathologist. Uh, among the mediastinal lesions, thymic lesions have been well characterized and they, uh, uh, they are more mainly based on the morphology and the immunophenotype. Research is on for further refinement of the subclassification and also to identify the feasibility of uh, uh, targeted therapies. And uh, uh, the topic uh, is uh, approach to the mediastinal uh, lesions and uh, update on thymic lesions. Let me introduce the speaker, Dr. Tripti Pai. Uh, she took her MD from Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, Mumbai, and uh, did her uh, fellowship in translational cancer medicine and molecular pathology. Uh, she, uh, she obtained her master's in research from King's College, London. She joined Tata Memorial Center in 2017. Uh, she, she has a special interest in uh, thoracic oncopathology and molecular pathology. Uh, and she is uh, uh, currently interested in her uh, research interest is in uh, biomarker assays in lung tumors. And uh, uh, she is actively involved in reporting and validation of all uh, solid tumor molecular assays, including those based on next generation sequencing. She has more than 34 papers to her uh, credit and also four textbook chapters. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind introduction. Uh, I will share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, visible. Okay, fine. I will start. So very good evening to all. So we'll switch the gears from lung tumors and we'll, uh, we'll see how to approach mediastinal tumors and with some updates on thymomas. So plan of my talk is, we'll see what is the spectrum of mediastinal tumors, which are the cl common clinical scenarios and how you deal with the patients of mediastinal lesions. We'll see histopathological features of thymomas, some updates, change in the nomenclature of thymic tumors. And then finally, we will see how do we actually apply all these histopathological and clinical features and deal with the routine diagnostic cases. So mainly I will stick to the anterior mediastinal lesions. So if we divide mediastinum, it is like superior and inferior mediastinum. 
and inferior mediastinum has anterior middle and posterior so we will be restricting ourselves to anterior mediastinum now why anterior mediastinum so if we see anterior mediastinum like approximately 60% are malignant and of this most common are thymomas so there will be like germ cell tumors lymphomas thymomas in anterior superior masses but most common is thymomas if we see middle mediastinum most commonly we see are lymphomas and if we see posterior mediastinal masses most common are neurogenic tumor so we should know that which are the basic location of a tumor that is the first thought that should come to your mind when we see the site of the biopsy now as a pathologist it is not just our job to see the slides so before we pick up any slides we should ask for certain demographic features like age gender in mediastinal masses especially it is very important that you also check what is the physical examination for example if there is a male patient as the genital examination done is testicular examination done and not just that about the clinical symptoms that what is the severity and the duration of the symptoms for example if it is like incidentally detected most commonly it is like something benign whereas 80 80% of such masses are benign whereas 50% of all mediastinal masses more than half are malignant if the patient presents with symptoms so imaging wise if we see ct scan is the recommended imaging and if it is a suspicion for solid cystic then mri fdg pet is not routinely performed only performed when there is like a lymphoma suspicion and to monitor response to therapy and which is the most important different test is that serum tumor marker levels so which is like must when you deal with the mediastinal masses so imaging clinical features and serum biomarker levels so with this like combined modality of assessing most of the times with the combination of this demographic clinical presentation and imaging finding it allows a presumptive diagnosis and not all lesions in anterior mediastinum are biopsied so we'll see few clinical scenarios for example there is a 20 year old mediast uh, patient with mediastinal masses encasing great vessels rapid onset of symptoms svc syndrome imaging wise pulmonary lesion what next as we say we will do serum tumor marker levels and if it is raised the diagnosis is non seminomatous or whatever is the tumor marker we will say it is a germ cell tumor second scenario if it is a 30 year old patient with mediastinal mass prolonged onset of symptoms associated with myasthenia gravis you don't need any biopsy diagnosis for this it is like a <coughs> thymoma so there will be certain things based on all the demographic and combination all features you will be able to make a diagnosis so what is it that is scary about mediastinal lesion what are the pathologist perspective so if you see most of the time we end up having very tiny biopsy very scanty material there will be lot of crushing because of this expedited review they ask for frozen section again there are frozen artifacts lot of fibrosis hyalinization so see, these are usually like the common uh, issues with the mediastinal lesions to sufficiently define a specific character it is said that actually 3 to 5 cores are essential but this is not ideally the case uh, that we deal with and one thing we should keep in mind that whenever there is discrepancy you feel it is inadequate you should ask for a repeat biopsy we should not feel like this we can't ask and it is invasive because the treatment implications are immense so as i said our uh, today's talk is on the anterior superior mediastinal masses and restricted to thymomas so let's see what are thymomas so thymomas are thymic epithelial neoplasm that display some of the organotypic features what do you mean by organotypic like like a normal thymus it will have lobular architecture it will have medullary differentiation like you may see hazel's corpuscles which are normally seen there will be perivascular spaces and what is the classical hallmark of thymoma is there is a dual epithelial as well as lymphoid cell population of course with a variable number of immature cells so this is a typical gross of uh, picture of a thymoma so you can see lobules vague lobulated grayish white yellowish white area separated by fibrous septae it can have heterogeneous cystic fatty areas hemorrhagic areas there can be necrotic areas but all in all if you see it will be a firm lobulated kind of picture now from grossing point of view what is important see most of the time if it is like difficult from imaging and all biopsy is done and the diagnosis is uh, made on the biopsy but if it is like a resection thing what is important is that 
first on external surface identify if something is adhered there or not for example here there is lung here there is pericardium here there is fat everything so that is more important when you do crossing why because capsular status and tumor invasiveness are the most important prognostic matter most of the time what happens the resident gets stuck here only and there are just one or two sections from this area but what is important on this section that you just like focus on this tumor and other rest of the tissue interface for example this is the so this is how you will take sections from the tumor and the surrounding interface and then within the tumor what you will do you will do from different heterogeneous areas so this is very important from grossing point of view so thorough sampling of this interface if it is less than 5 cm you can submit it entirely if it is more than 5 cm at least one section per cm should be your mainstay but again the focus will be on the tumor nodules interface with the non neoplastic tissue if it is a very cystic lesion then you have to sample very adequately the surrounding solid lesion surrounding solid tissue sometimes it has this cystic germ cell tumor there are metastatic carcinomas in the solid there is this ectopic thyroid tissue malignant lymphoma so whenever there is cystic just don't focus on the cyst look at the surrounding solid areas near the cyst so these are certain points to be kept in mind from crossing point of view so masoka koga staging and eight stage uh, uh, addition tnm staging so if we see who 2020 now the focus and the preference is for to go with the eighth edition so there are this uh, different so one thing to keep in mind that masoka koga 1 2a 2b everything is like tnm stage 1 because there was no survival difference between 1 2a 1 versus 2b what is the distinct survival difference is between the stage 3 versus stage 1 so this is the main difference and then there are many changes so main thing is that you will focus on the eighth edition of tnm stage if we see 2021 who classification what are the different types of thymomas so like previous thymomas it is just again type a type ab and in b you have b1 b2 b3 and there are this three distinct thymomas so when we deal with so much of the histological variations there is uh, you have to keep in mind lot of things so we should know what are the management implications so if it is a thymic lesion most of the time resection is the main stage if it is a early stage you can resect the thymectomy with the adjacent adhered structure is the main stage because that is the curative intensity if this is the uh, thing when it is like a early or a locally advanced what if it is a metastatic metastatic then again chemotherapy so we should not think that type a thymoma cannot metastasize so all of the thymos thymomas from type a to type b3 all have this metastatic potentials why i am telling because sometimes you get like widely metastatic thing you get bone metastasis lung metastasis and you see type a like features it doesn't exclude it can still be a type a thymomas so all the types of thymoma has metastatic potentials so when it is a metastatic uh, disease irrespective of the histological subtypes patient gets chemotherapy if it is a early subtypes there will be certain scenarios for example then this matter like which is the histological type so if it is a b3 thymoma and there is just just invasion into the surrounding or oh, adjuvant rt is given adjuvant chemotherapy is given so that is why it is important also if you just see the histological subtypes there is a survival difference so type a thymoma if it is a very well resected it has a survival thing of 10 10 years is a very good survival 94% as against type b3 the survival is approximately 60% so all in all there are treatment implications we should be able to classify which is the type of thymomas so with this we will we'll see which are the histological types so if we see this picture so what is it it is like a elongated spindly type of tumor cells so when we see a mediastinal lesion we see a spindly elongated spindle cell morphology so what is the thing that we should come in mind like you know it is a thymoma and spindle cell type the look is like uh, some soft tissue like a mesenchymal thing if that is the thought process you come to you like a spindle cell neuroendocrine or is it a sft that kind of picture then it is usually a type a thymoma if there is a the same features but there is increased cellularity with some mitotic figures and or necrosis there is a criteria called as a, there is a subtype called as atypical type a so type a is a spindle cell thymoma there is paucity of lymphocytes you don't get so many lymphocytes there now if you see b1 b2 b3 
there is if the look is like a lymphoid rich lesion like you feel you are looking at a lymph node and then which type of thymoma is it it is a b1 thymoma so you feel the very bland lymphoid cell mediastinal lesion and you see bland lymphoid rich lesion you actively hunt and you see some where if you are lucky you will see some singly scattered epithelioid cell that is usually how a b1 thymoma will look like b2 thymoma is like a lymphoepithelioma there are extensive lymphocytes but some pink pink areas you will see and then you will see there is this aggregates of three or four epithelioid polygonal cells that is how a typical b2 thymoma looks like and how is b3 it is epithelial predominant you will see sheets monolayer sheets of pink looking cells these are epithelioid cells again there can be variable so here we'll have predominant lymphoid here we'll have moderate lymphoid and here we'll have scanty to absent lymphoid immature t lymphoid cells so this is how a b1 b2 b3 so we saw uh, type a which was a spindle cell thymoma b1 b2 b3 this is the spectrum now what is ab where you say spindle and then you say distinct abrupt or it can be a intricate admixture of lymphoid rich areas so there is spindle a type region and there is b type areas so this is like a ab thymoma so when we see individual case it is very easy but when actually you apply on case there are lot of diagnostic dilemma so which are the three clinical scenarios where you actually get confused is to distinguish b1 thymoma where lot of lymphoid versus t lymphoblastic lymphoma then a and b3 both are epithelial predominant one is spindle cell one is polygonal both are lymphocyte poor so this is another area of diagnostic dilemma and then it is b3 thymoma versus thymic carcinoma so these are three scenarios where you usually struggle in your routine practice so we'll see what is what happens with b1 thymoma so as we said it is lymphoid rich this is a cortical so if you do tdt it will be strong and diffusely positive so what is the thing if you get a mediastinal mass lymphoid rich and if you just put 3 20 and tdt mib1 and you don't include a1 a3 you will easily miss a type b1 thymoma so mediastinal mass no matter how it looks a1 a3 should be your basic panel so you will see this lace like pattern this is a typical a1 a3 cytokeratin network that you see in in thymic lesions and then how do you mark the thymic epithelial cells either with a p63 p40 or with a pax set so this is how you will identify and distinguish this mind well you should always include a1 a3 in a lymphoid rich mediastinal biopsy second thing type a now type a as we said it is a spindle cell it can have a variable morphology it can have this rosetting that is why i said when you see a new mediastinal mass you feel it is a neuroendocrine tumor some adenoid areas microcystic areas staghorn vasculature like a sft or synovial sarcoma if that is the thing you are getting always put paxet and a1 a3 in your panel okay before you just jump on to any spindle cell or a mesenchymal lesion always put a1 a3 and paxet so this was a, a very bland looking spindle elongated cells as against b3 if you see both will have lymphoid less areas but b3 will be monolayer sheets pink abundant cytoplasm lot of clearing and there will be if you are lucky you will find some admixed lymphoid cells if you put tdt it will highlight some immature scattered t lymphoid cells so this is how a b3 and a will look like now third the difficulty is b3 versus thymic carcinoma so now thymic carcinoma like any other thymic car carcinoma will show you clear cut evidence of atypia then it will have infiltrating growth so you will have small nests and cords with desmoplastic stroma and there will be absence of any immature tdt so all these are very close differentials so there will be some nuances and some like over a period of time when you see still it is very difficult and uh, the the difference is quite subtle in this so these are the three basic diagnostic dilemmas so if i want to put it across like which are the ihcs which are so these were the histological features ihc if i see a1 a3 is most important you will see that lace like meshwork so this is b1 b2 and b3 you can see in b1 there is like a loose meshwork you will not see any obvious perivascular spaces like you see in b2 or b3 in b2 again there is this intense meshwork but there will be a evident perivascular spaces and because b3 is like sheets of epithelial cells even the epithelial network is very 
strong and very intense like a score her to score three plus so this is how uh, a1 a3 mesh work is seen in uh, thymomas another thing i said to highlight the thymic epithelial cells pack set p63 p40 remember sometimes there is like a presentation is with the lung mass and you get p63 p40 which is often misdiagnosed as squamous carcinoma because of this positivity mind well all variants of thymomas and thymic carcinomas can show this positivity and in fact it helps in diagnosis of thymomas so keep this pitfall in mind tdt for immature t lymphoid cells cd20 is good in highlighting epithelial if you are like different difficulty in differentiation type a versus type b3 cd20 can highlight the epithelial cells cd5 ck positivity can be seen in thymic carcinoma it can be negative as well it doesn't mean that 100% of thymic carcinomas can have to show this cd5 and ck positivity but when if it is when it is positive you can err on the side of thymic carcinoma so to sum it all if there is a thymic tumor you will see a lymphoid component if it is like present significantly present look at the epithelial cells if it is epithelial predominant it becomes a b3 thymoma if it is lymphoepithelioma type like intense lymphocytes as well but very obviously epithelioid cells also then it is b2 if it is too many lymphocytes with any without any obvious epithelial cells it is b1 thymoma and of course you will put ihc and highlight the a1 a3 mesh, mesh work if needed if the lymphoid component is sparse look at the epithelial type if it is spindle it is mostly type a thymoma type ab or it can be a neuroendocrine tumor if it is epithelioid polygonal pink sheets with abundant cytoplasm lobular architecture it is type b3 thymoma it can be carcinoma also so this is overall how you approach a thymic tumor <clears throat> so if we say 2021 who classification so overall the features maintained are the concept of classification nomenclature what are the diagnostic criteria reporting strategy all in all is maintained the nomenclature is same two two features they have deleted that is microscopic thymomas which are now called as nodular epithelial hyperplasias and sclerosing thymomas they are considered to represent conventional thymomas with regressive changes so you we, we do not use this microscopic thymoma and sclerosing thymomas terminology for example if there are combined tumors you have thymoma you have thymic carcinoma you have carcinoid any spectrum of thymic tumors you will report it as combined tumor most aggressive component will come first for example if you have a small cell carcinoma and you have a thymoma you will say combined tumor combined small cell carcinoma and thymoma if you have thymoma different types you will state it in the components in 10% incremental for example you have b3 thymoma and you have type a you will first mention type b3 thymoma how much percentage and type a if there are thymic carcinomas which are the different types again the aggressive type will come first so are there some terminology changes in thymic carcinomas so they have included this hyaluronizing clear cell carcinoma which is similar to that seen in the salivary gland tumor with the ews r1 gene rearrangement and there is thymic sebaceous carcinoma similar to that is uh, seen in the cutaneous counterpart there are some difference uh, there's some change in the nomenclature for example if you see a papillary adenocarcinoma if it is a low grade you call it low grade papillary adenocarcinoma when it is like a bland histological feature so when you use low grade papillary it it signifies it has a indolent clinical course what if it is a high grade adenocarcinoma with papillary features you will just call it adenocarcinoma nos lymphoepithelioma like carcinoma is now replaced as lymphoepithelial carcinomas and mucinous adenocarcinomas is reclassified as enteric type adenocarcinoma now this enteric type adenocarcinoma will show expression of this one or more enteric markers like cdx2 or ck20 mind well it can be non mucinous as well but you have to demonstrate the expression of this enteric markers now it is very tricky when you actually get a mediastinal mass to call it enteric type you have to actually exclude any gi primary you have to exclude metastasis from elsewhere before you say it is a primary thymic enteric type adenocarcinoma so these were all the histological terminology change 
what is recent is that classification is strongly reinforced by new molecular findings so if we see the molecular level rna expression studies or copy number variations they have seen that type a and type b is different spectrum as compared to type b1 b2 b3 so what we see histologically is also different on the molecular thing and both of these thymomas are genomically distinct from thymic carcinomas so they have like different clusters a like cluster b like cluster ab and c like cluster as of now we don't use this in any of our diagnostic criteria or in routine diagnostics again you can see some kind of mutations in hras which are seen in type a type b loss of function mutations in p53 is very typical of thymic carcinomas and type b thymomas there are some gene fusions of mammal 2 which are reported in metaplastic thymomas so no need to get worked up it is just for the awareness that there is enhancement of the molecular work on the thymic lesion but what is it what is important we are not able to find any oncogenic driver mutation so whatever we have targeted treatment till now we are not able to find any driver mutation there are some targeted treatment with eborelimus or cases in which you get p3 ca mutations or c kit when you have like uh, exhausted all the standard lines in third fourth line some targeted treatment can be given there is a low tumor mutational burden it might uh, it, this might limit the value of currently available immune checkpoint inhibitors and if we see there is if you do this pdl1 expression is very extensive and strong in thymomas but the use, utility of icci is not this because there is very high incidence of immune mediated toxicity especially in thymic lesions so open questions in relation to thymomas are pathogenesis is remains largely unknown no biomarker is available to predict the response as of now the key challenge is in the drug development due to paucity of the cell lines and also we have to see how we can exploit this better exploit the strong expression of pdl1 if you are not able to give icci so many further studies are essential so that uh, this can be dealt with in details so with this we will start we'll see what are the case based discussion so i have included certain cases where which presented like a anterior mediastinal masses and what was the spectrum so case number 1 so i hope time is so so this is the case number 1 27 year old male so hrct showed a 7 into 5 cm soft tissue density in anterior mediastinum there was no other lesion elsewhere so what are we seeing there is this multiple tissue cores with at this far i can just see there are pink and blue areas so if you go on high par there is some crushing there are some blue dot dot mostly lymphoid cells and then there are this crushed cells and there are there are some inflammatory cells that is what we can make out at this part there are this in between highly nice stroma at places you feel there are some ill defined histiocytic aggregates and again lot of crushing absolutely no morphological histomorphological preservation same but what we can see is that there is some different type of cells here the crushed ones and this ones so as i said any mediastinal mass i usually prefer doing a1 a3 and cd30 i will tell you why so this is a1 a3 so what i was thinking was initially as a crushed and inflammatory cells all are showing this dot like reactivity so i am very sure it is not a inflammatory thing so this is how a dot like reactivity and cd30 i usually prefer doing in a fibrotic and with this because it highlights this hrs cells in uh, classical hodgkin so even if sometimes they are not visible in between the inflammatory cells cd30 can highlight so always when you can't make out there is lot of fibrosis and inflammation always put a1 a3 and cd30 as at least in your panel so cd30 is dead negative pack set also i did because a1 a3 positive and thymic i mean mediastinal lesion is it some thymic lesion so pack set was negative so i again started looking at the hne like what is it that is highlighted by the a1 a3 still absolute lot of crushing you can't make out any individual cell details so what is the marker young male a1 a3 positivity few ill defined granulomas this is the sal4 so germ cell tumor should always be considered 
so this is the sulfur which shows diffuse nucleus so all those crushed cells and because it was like a germ cell tumor there are this intervening lymphoid cells also and there are this ill defined granulomas also so this is a sulfur this is a octrefor so octrefor comes positive in seminomas and embryonal carcinomas so sulfur positive makes it a germ cell tumor sulfur positive and octrefor positive can be seen in seminomas and embryonal but we al already did cd30 it was negative so what remains is seminoma so then just for confirmation we did d214 it was strongly and diffusely positive so this was a case of a seminomatous tumor so what do we learn from this case is there is lot of crushing no definite morphological features ill formed granulomas are there you should have a high index of suspicion and just don't disregard it at relevant ihcs and you will be able to get that so in this case there were no serum tumor markers done only after uh, we gave this uh, diagnosis later it was done and just the marker raised was ldh okay so this was first case now what are the other usual scenarios that you get so you get this again you would see this uh, tissue cores you are having pink and blue areas similar to previous but you can see like lot of preservation like like autolytic change very shrunken cells so some ihcs were run, nothing was working in this so there is a improper tissue preservation obscured morphological features ihc were non contributory asked for a repeat evaluation this was a outside referral uh, paraffin block so patient was evaluated a repeat biopsy was asked so again you see pink and blue areas lot of inflammatory cells and vascular proliferation again so when you see fibrosis lot of inflammatory cells see if the inflammatory cells are plasma cell rich or eosinophil rich if it is a eosinophil rich what else will you see you will start hunting for singly scattered atypical cells now don't expect mediastinal hrs cells to be like typical owl eye or a binucleated that we see in lymph nodes it is usually sometimes hidden like a mononuclear with a high nc ratio so even that is considered a large atypical cell so it will be like somewhere here and there sometimes some cases you will see very obviously this singly scattered cells amidst so usually nodular sclerosis subtype you can see high load of this kind of hrs cells but in some cases you have to literally hunt and you will see just one cell here and there and how do you highlight it cd30 pax5 ebv lmp and 320 so all these markers you will do to reach to a diagnosis of classical hodgkin so what do we learn like if you, even if you don't see any obvious hrs cells you see fibrosis hyalinization inflammatory cells always put cd30 marker which might highlight this singly scattered atypical cells so what is this another mediastinal lesion like sheets of blastoid cells atypical cells in thymomas we get reactive thymocytes but these are like sheets of blastoid looking cells tdt positive this is how a T lymphoblastic lymphoma will look like. So with this, we will see another interesting case. So this is a 33-year-old male. He had a huge right hemithoracic mass, displacing all the mediastinal structure in a very poor condition. Mild diffusion. Tumor markers were within normal limits. And patient had undergone a CT-guided biopsy outside, and a huge panel of uh, IHC was done, and it was labeled as round cell sarcoma. so patient was started on sarcoma chemotherapy the condition worsened he was then admitted in icu he was then planned for ifos atriamycin which is again a sarcoma uh, therapy, chemotherapy regimen but patient was absolutely not doing well so this is how a biopsy looks like so we received a single core so very pink can you see this vague nesting patterns so vague nesting pattern plasma cytoid morphology so see you can see plasma cytoid morphology so because a huge panel of ic was already performed still i thought that i should first entirely rule out whether it is some neuroendocrine tumor such a very uh, unique kind of nesting pattern cohesion plasma cytoid morphology so i decided to put a1a3 and ema 
A1, A3, and EMA were dead negative. Because of the plasma cytoid morphology and vascular this thing, I also thought whether this can be some plasma cell lesion. CD138 was negative. And another very helpful marker, when you have this suspicion of some hematolymphoid lesion, like plasma cytoid, plasma cells, so MUM1 is a very good marker. So if it is negative, you can like fairly exclude a hematolymphoid malignancy. So now that MUM1 was strong and diffusely positive. So we know it is a hematolymphoid malignancy. And how is the morphology? The morphology was very uniformly plasma cytoid with vague nesting pattern. So if that is the thing, what is the diagnosis that we should keep in mind is a PMBCL. So you do Paxfire. It was strongly and diffusely positive. This was CD20, strong and diffuse. CD3 highlights few of the reactive T lymphoid cells. And CD200 was done, which is usually seen in PMBCL. So this was a case of PMBCL. So the points to thing is that the sarcoma, the patient had like gross pleural effusion, widespread like nodal thing. So always have a hematolymphoid. When a patient is very serious, you have to always keep that thing in mind. And especially this PMB cell have this lot of cohesion and it can be mistaken for carcinoma. So always have this high index of suspicion for PMB cell. And just calling it DLBCL will not help because then it gets Archop regimen. Whereas if you call it PMBCL, it gets R epoch, which is again aggressive. The patient received, he had immediate symptomatic uh, relief. Now the patient has completed four cycles of this R epoch and is now due for PET CT to see the response. But patient is symptomatically very much better. So this is how mediastinal lesions are very tricky and like you can have a different spectrum and all the lesions are like, if you treat them in time, they will have, especially these lymphomas, it will be very good for the patients. Okay, let's come to case three. I hope I have time. So this is a 46 year old gentleman from Karnataka. He is a zero positive patient. He had no addiction, no COVID infection. Patient came with just a uh, one pill, only lung window. And uh, the report mentioned he has a gross pericardial effusion with lung lesions. There was a supraclavicular lymph node palpable. So this is a 46 year old. So serum tumor markers, normal mediastinal lesion biopsy was done. And because of the pericardial effusion, cytology was sent. So this was a pericardial cytology. And we will see some bland lymphoid cells. So nothing or uh, diagnostic on this material frozen section mediastinal biopsy. So as I said, frozen section is done because of the emergency thing, but you will see just hyalinization and there are some crushed cells. So then we ask for additional material intraop only for the paraffin processing. Now, if you see there is this lung parenchyma and there are this lymphoid rich pores. When I saw this, I was very sure this is a type B1 thymoma. So very bland looking lymphocytes. And I thought that sometimes you cannot see epithelioid cells, but A1, A3 will highlight that lace-like network. So I actively look for any epithelioid cells, but I couldn't find one. So lymphoid rich neoplasm. My first marker is A1, A3. So we can see the native lung parenchyma very nicely highlighted. This is A1, A3. Then you put your first panel will be A1, A3, 23. So as expected, 20 negative, 3 is strong diffuse. TDT is strong diffuse. And then MIP1 is like almost 100%. So now what is it? So absolutely like bland looking lymphoid cells, but A1, A3 meshwork is not seen and this is. So is it some kind of a thymic lymphoid hyperplasia? I was thinking bland looking, absolutely no blastoid morphology. But if it is a thymic lymphoid hyperplasia, you will see admixture of 320 cells. You are absolutely 20 negative and 3 is majority of cells. So is it T-lymphoblastic lymphoma? We thought again, we are again and again looking at the biopsy slide, looking at the morphology. Again, we retrieve the pericardial effusion. But the lymphoid cells are too, way too bland. 
this is how a lymphoblastic blastoid morphology will look like our case was absolutely bland lymphocytes again there was a very high mib1 almost 100% this is how a b1 thymoma looks like and this is how a typical a1 a3 meshwork in a typical b1 thymoma is there so again we looked at our a1 a3 so somewhere we see this weak meshwork weak very weak islet you go and again and again and you find some focal area this is now not how a a1 a3 in a b1 thymoma looks like but there are some areas like this so what do we do there is a lmo2 marker like which will come in lymphoblastic lymphoma and will not come in b1 thymoma this also we did but it was dead negative or this is the marker paxet so as we said like a1 a3 meshwork or you do paxet p40 p63 which highlights the epithelial cells so paxet was positive and very strongly positive so you have a lung parenchyma lymphoid rich neoplasm 3 and tdt strong diffuse with very high mib1 20 negative a1 a3 at place is very focally weakly positive and paxet is strong and diffuse we are very confident that it is a b1 thymoma but because of the atypical features we gave this differential uh, consider considered and we favored type b1 the moment we said it is b1 thymoma the imaging person he calls and says it is absolutely not a thymoma this is a huge necrotic mass with suv 13 there is a gross pericardial effusion there are this nodal nodes suv nodes involvement this is not how a b1 thymoma will look like we think it is a lymphoma so we kept on saying so there was lot of they did again a repeat biopsy so if you see repeat biopsy now there are this lymphoid cells and very obvious epithelioid cells like a b2 areas we can see here see there are lymphoid cells and there, there is this clusters of epithelioid cells now you do a1 a3 there is like a typical is like meshwork tdt is strong paxet is strong diffuse and now this is like a thymoma b1 to b2 so what was the management difference here it was because it was non resectable upfront he received a different chemo reg uh, regimen and followed by a assess uh, assessment so that to see if surgical resection is possible or not so what do we learn here mediastinal biopsy i will keep on repeating cytokeratin should be done some cases may show sometimes loss of the cytokeratin and paxit and p63 will help in such cases single marker should not believe ki67 can be sometimes very high in normal thymic tissue also so histomorphology is very important now clinical radiological correlation whatever it is patient is very fit he is coming walking in uh, opd he cannot be a case of lymphoma isn't it he, it cannot be a t lymphoblastic that is the thing and whenever in doubt or inadequate tissue you can ask for a repeat biopsy so this case was a very good uh, learning lesson and there are multiple things that and if you are in a doubt always take a second opinion with a person having a lateral thinking so combination of demographic clinical presentation is of immense importance when dealing with mediastinal regions now next case 40 year old man or old patient and it came with a right lung biopsy with outside diagnosis of small cell carcinoma this is how the biopsy fragments look like so in no way this is looking like a small cell carcinoma very bland spindle kind of cells and again there are this lymphoid cells in between so lymphoid cells and bland appearing spindle to at places polygonal cells there are this postcellular areas with fibrotic stroma very bland elongated spindle cells isn't it looks like a type a thymoma so what should be so this was labeled as lung there was no native lung parenchyma there were this epithelioid and spindle cells with admixed lymphoid cells there was no mitotic activity no necrosis there was at places staghorn like vasculature so first dd is thymoma so you will put a1 a3 paxet tdt and also keep a differential of sft because of the staghorn vasculature and as i said that mesenchymal appearance is always like a confusion with type a thymoma so cd34 so this panel is fair enough so meanwhile i also received a call saying ki outside called as small cell carcinoma doesn't look like a small cell doesn't look a, like a lung primary only so this is how a1 a3 looks like very strong diffuse meshwork paxet again strong diffuse this was tdt so in tdt if you say there are some areas which are very high some areas absence of staining 
So this was a case of thymoma and we favored type AB because of this admixture of lymphocyte rich and lymphoid poor and very uh, spindly appearing cells. So always like even if it is looking neuroendocrine, look if mitosis is seen, necrosis is seen. If you feel always you can just like spindle cell tumor, further IC is needed rather than calling it as a small cell carcinoma. So this is another case with a 33 year old male patient. He was a case of high grade spindle cell sarcoma. He underwent inguinal lymph node dissection and resection in 2018. Then he had pulmonary meds. Patient was on chemotherapy. And then recently there was this soft tissue lesion, SUV of four in the superior mediastinum. Rest there was nothing in the primary site. So this is how a biopsy looks. A very fragmented adipose tissue, blood. And there are these blue appearing fragments here and there. So you see, again, a very lymphoid rich. There are Hazel's corpuscles. So nothing fibrous stroma in between, just adipose tissue and this thymic tissue. So this was like some native thymic tissue only, just that they're saying it's a huge mass, like four centimeter mass. So just for curiosity, we did this A183, expecting it that we will just see some septal thing. So to our surprise, again, there is like, lot of meshwork that is seen. This is CD3, which is strong diffuse. Now, if you see, there is a clear cut demarcation. This is TDT positive and this is 20 positive. So what is it showing? That there is a lymphoid hyperplasia. And A1, A3 meshwork is showing that there is a, so there is a epithelial hyperplasia. So it was a case of thymic hyperplasia. So we have to say whether it is like a representative of the lesion or not. So radiology uh, imaging person, he said this was taken from the most pet avid lesion. So we call this as a thymic hyperplasia. So why not like, why not it can be a type A thymoma? So if you see there are this cores, like you feel it is a normal thymic tissue. There is absolutely no fibrous bands in between. As we say for a thymoma, you should have a lobulated fibrous stroma. There is absolutely no. So point to be noted here is that just mere IHC and this meshwork with this doesn't make it a thymoma. Just look at the histomorphological features and correlate with the imaging finding. So with this, I come to the last part. I uh, got a WhatsApp message from one of my friends, one of my colleagues who sent me this picture and asked if this A1, A3 is okay for a T lymphoblastic lymphoma. So I said, just based on this, it is very difficult to say. So she said that she has already signed it out as a T lymphoblastic and later she thought that A1, A3 should be done. So I asked her, what is the clinical scenario? So it is like a very typical 14 year old male, SVC syndrome, mediastinal mass, very high LDH, CD3, TDT, strong diffuse, KI67, CD20. So a very typical T lymphoblastic. So she sent then me a histopathology core. So it is a very obviously a lymphoblastic thing. See? So what do we do now? Is it okay to get such kind of meshwork? So then I asked her to send a low power image of this scanner view. And you can see out of the three cores, only one core, which can be some native thymic septal. And it is not seen in any of the rest of the lymphoid rich region, you are not seeing this meshwork. So you can safely call it as a T lymphoblasting, nothing to worry here. So point is there will be variation in the IC expression. There can be tricky cases. One marker is never sufficient and panel with histomorphological and clinical correlation is of utmost importance. So with this, I would like to end my talk. I would be happy to take any questions if anyone has. Thank you, Dr. Tripti, for the very excellent presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, most of them related to frozen section. How can we overcome frozen section disadvantages? How can we? Overcome the disadvantages no. of frozen section. No, it is not possible for us to like, because the tissues are very uh, tiny and when you freeze it, 
it is very tiny sometimes it is very fatty also so you have to freeze it more often and then you get this freezing artifact so it is very difficult for us to overcome this uh, the second question is how can we differentiate types of thymoma on frozen will typing on frozen adversely affect the type of surgery no no so you don't get typing of thymomas in a frozen section you don't get that often and even if you get like there is no need so actually i am not uh, understanding the question if it is a thymoma it is not a uh, like uh, something emergency so we don't get frozen for this you usually get frozen when a patient has a svc syndrome a very acute presentation only then that time we get a frozen can we differentiate lymphoma from b1 thymoma on frozen frozen section no it is not possible to differentiate you have to give it as lymphoid rich neoplasm and await paraffin process and when it is very obviously like blastoid morphology you can say and you can at least if they say patient is very sick very high ldh you can say suspect uh, suspect lymphoma but it is very tricky so small cell carcinomas lymphoma it is very tricky so such such times what happens you know if the patient is very young svc syndrome you you can err on the side of uh, this lymphoma and give the benefit of doubt so immediately when steroids are given patient has a symptomatic relief but all these are very tricky cases can we distinguish between thymoma with necrosis and thymic carcinoma on cytology on can cytology. we distinguish between thymoma with necrosis and thymic carcinoma on cytology you mean on cytology smears or histopathologically cell cellular features uh, it is written cytology uh can uh i think it's cytology ma'am i think cytology smears what in cytology smears yeah. no no yes. cytology smears it is very difficult to say so if it is a thymic if you see lot of lymphoid cells at least you can say that it is like a thymic i mean thymoma more so if you say in thymomas if you have type a thymoma you will have a ovoid spindly cells and then necrosis can also be seen which is a feature of a atypical type a thymoma and for anything to be a thymic carcinoma you see obvious nuclear atypia so if you see nuclear atypia there is lot of new uh, pleomorphism and you see necrosis you can call it as a carcinoma is there so any after, in essential like mediastinal lesions are very difficult on biopsy so cytology are all the more difficult and we usually don't get to classify on cytology smears is there any role for cd5 in b3 and thymic carcinoma in thymic in b3 thymoma and thymic carcinoma so b3 thymoma and thymic carcinoma so what is the thing you know if you see a core with a lobulated architecture so if you see one lobule with a epithelial predominant you see in between fibrous bands which suggest that it is some lobular architecture the moment you start see a lobular architecture with some scattered lymphoid cells are on the side of b3 thymoma if you see dense sclerotic stroma and infiltrating islands cords disc cohesive cells with atypia are on the side of thymic carcinoma now in such cases you can do cd5 and seek it if it is strong and diffusely positive or you can say it is a thymic carcinoma but it is not like even in b3 thymoma you may get and even in thymic carcinoma it can be negative so it is mainly on the histomorphological features so look at the nuclear atp and the infiltration pattern what's your experience with pediatric thymic tumors are thymic carcinomas in this age group common or mm, in my experience at least i haven't seen in pediatric age group thymic carcinomas but my experience may be limited in just 3 4 years but i haven't come across can be distinguish between mediastinal nodular lymphocyte predominant hodgkin lymphoma versus T cell rich B cell lymphoma on a biopsy. Oh my God, very very difficult question. <laughs> I think so. NLPHL and T cell rich B cell lymphoma. I think it is a very tricky question. Usually NLPHL is the diagnosis when you have a solitary axillary nodal mass, 
and it is a very typical scenario you see and there will be various pattern here i have a personally no experience of t cell rich b cell versus nlphl in mediastinum do you use cd23 in primary mediastinal large b cell lymphoma yes so in pmbcl uh, there can be 23 positive cd30 positive and as uh, cd200 positive so there can be cases where you see 23 30 positive but when you have cd200 we will prefer doing cd200 but if you don't have cd200 cd23 positivity will help in the diagnosis that's all uh, thank you so much dr tripti for the very excellent session uh thank you ma'am thank you so we moving on to the last uh, talk of the day to introduce a speaker of the day uh, introduce a speaker let me invite dr lilly kuti portal ma'am had done her undergraduate and postgraduate from government medical college kottayam and she's retired as addition professor from kottayam government medical college now she's a professor at pushpagiri institute of medical science um, over to you ma'am thank you dr ani for the nice introduction um, so the, we have come to the last topic of today's webinar and the topic is mediastinal tumors other than thymomas if you all know mediastinum is a wide area with so many normal structures within it we have a variety of histopathological lesions arising from that other than thymomas so here we have dr rajiv to enlighten us about the mediastinal tumors other than thymomas and dr rajiv was the opening batsman of today's webinar and he is the professor and pathologist of tata memorial hospital mumbai and i think it, he was already introduced so we will directly go into the topic so dr rajiv over yeah. to you sir thank you ma'am for your kind introduction and uh... let me share my screen can you see my screen ma'am yes yes just just give me a second okay uh i am going to talk on uh, approach to the mediastinal tumors other than uh, epithelial uh, tumors uh, so uh, uh, dr trupti has very nicely introduced you to the various common entities in the mediastinum and also touch up uh, uh, also showed some cases for the tumors other than uh, the thymomas so it uh, she has made my life little easy and uh, there can be some overlap of the cases because these are the common problems which uh, we encountered uh, day in and day out when we deal with uh, these regions so as you know that mediastinal uh, tumor uh, site is divided into the, the four main compartments and uh, with the heterogeneous and the variety of the tumors uh, do occur here and uh, as uh, early, early earlier covered by dr trupti the the primary tumors which are in the in the adults and the and the childhood they are quite different so as uh, in adults although thymomas are, are the are the common one whereas in the in the pediatric uh, age group uh, uh, lymphomas or the germ cell tumors they form the major uh, chunk of, of of the tumor so that's why we have in addition to the thymomas which has various its epithelial types thymomas thymic carcinomas and uh, other uh, type different special type of carcinomas uh, germ cell tumor and hematolymphoid malignancy they all they form the ma major non thymic thymoma uh, tumors in the in the mediastinum and in addition sometime uh, we do also in addition to that uh, we do get sometime neuroendocrine tumors or the mesenchymal uh, tumors so uh, in next uh, 40 to 45 minutes i will try to touch up briefly on on some of these entity based on the case based uh, uh, discussion uh as i mentioned there are some cases uh, we have already discussed so it might be little relatively easy for you uh to 
uh, to uh, identify them or pick pick them and so that and even i can also quickly move move on to the next cases so uh, the first case it was a 35 year old female with a large mediastinal mass you can see there is a huge mass uh, which is occupying whole of the of the, of the mediastinum and uh, I'll show you some of the these cases as a uh, whole slide images and uh, uh, please bear with me because uh, sometimes these images uh, do take some time to open up and uh, uh, pop up on your uh, screen. So the mediastinum and the lung uh, lesion, one thing is you have to keep in mind that majority of the, of the times you, we have to deal with these small tissue cores. So the, this is one of the good biopsy from the mediastinum and you can see it is quite cellular. Uh, cellular cores and it is composed mainly by the, these sheets of uh, these monomorphic looking uh, looking cells. And uh, there are some areas which are uh, showing uh, this necrosis. Okay, so there are areas of necrosis that means it, we are likely to be dealing with uh, some high grade tumor. There are some uh, other areas which is showing fibrous response. So, so these are the normal uh, components uh, in any biopsies. If you come across from the from the mediastinum or uh, in uh, in this region, we will come across uh, these common features. But the, in this bi this particular biopsy, the main features are. Let me come to this uh, area, which is more cellular. It's composed of monotonous population of these diffuse sheet-like uh, cells. Let me go to show you one another section. Uh, we have uh, two slides. For, so usually we, we divide our tissues into the two blocks and uh, so that in all, all lung and mediastinal biopsy so that it can. So there are uh, in, in one another section, these there are some areas which have which is showing some uh, really, some cohesion in addition to but the cell predominantly they are uh, looking monotonous with some uh, preservation around the vessels. So uh, overall histomorphology is similar throughout. So the first thought uh, was in mind: is it because it it at place it is showing some cohesive sheets also? Is it some is it uh, epithelial malignancy or uh, not? And uh, as a first panel, uh, first marker which you should choose uh, in a mediastinum uh, as thymic epithelial tumors are more common. Is, is exclude a carcinoma before we go to anything else. So in this case, this particular case, uh, uh, cytokating was negative. And uh, the next uh, common thought, which we, when you see such morphology is uh, of a monotonous looking cells, is it a, uh, a hematolymphoid malignancy? And uh, the stain, which, uh, uh, which I'm projecting now, it is a CD20, which is strongly and diffusely uh, positive in throughout the tumor cells. So is it... Uh, uh, is it only uh, doing 20 is enough uh, for this case? Uh, that is not the case. We have to go beyond. And in addition to, the, to, to, to 20, this case was also strongly and diffusely positive for CD30. So we now we, we get a direction that this is a case which is 20 positive, 30, and also positive for 30, which is strongly and diffusely pos positive for both these, these markers. And uh, so and uh, Dr. Trupti also showed you one of the uh, of the similar case uh, uh, from her collection. And uh, there's a, another one, another marker which we did is a CD200, which is one of the marker which is considered to very specific uh, for a, which if it come positive, it can give a specific diagnosis for this entity, uh, which I'm uh, talking about, and it is CD200. And uh, the MIB1 uh, proliferation was quite, quite high in this case. And uh, so it, this is uh, the MIB1 proliferation. So you can see that it is, uh, it is a high-grade hematolymphoid malignancy, which is expressing CD20, CD3, CD30, CD200. So it is a case of uh, a primary mediastinal large B-cell uh, lymphoma. Uh, so, uh, especially in a young females, uh, we, uh, this is a tumor which usually comes with in a young female. So, if a young female uh, which uh, is showing a monotonous population of lymphoid cells, we first differential in a mediastinum, we have to keep in mind our, of a primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. 
and CD20, uh, 30 and 23 occurs uh, come positive in majority of the cases. I'll show you uh, one another case. Can you see uh, this case of my screen, ma'am? Yes. Yeah, so this is another case of uh, similar with a similar diagnosis. And here you can see there are a lot of crushing and even some large uh, bizarre cells. Uh, but there is a lot of fibrosis, which is obscuring the morphology, which is which was relatively better preserved in the first case. But and in these uh, areas, it is showing a similar expression. Similar to the first case, CD20 was diffusely uh, positive. And uh, this is CD23. So CD23 uh, and one of the delegate also asked, do you use 23? So T23 previously uh, it, it can come positive uh, in primary mediation large cell lymphoma, but you have to keep in mind all PMBCLs, they do not express uh, uh, 20, CD23. So it can be uh, either a focal positive or it can be negative uh, as well as as well for uh, CD20. And another marker which uh, you have to keep in mind uh, sometime, oh, oh, just a second, See, this, is, this is CD30. 20 and uh, 20. yeah. So another marker which you have, which can, uh, which PMBCLs can express is a, uh, uh, this is a nuclear marker, this is a P63. So you have to be very cautious, uh, especially if you are thinking about uh, uh, thymic carcinomas, because thymic carcinomas are usually paxate and, and, uh, and, and uh, P63 positive. So uh, if you restrict your panel only to the limited markers and start with only squamous markers like a P63 or so uh, primary mediation of large B-cell lymphoma, they can be uh, they can express p63 and uh, so you should not get carried out uh, carried out uh, by the apparent p63 uh, expression uh, it is a, a well known uh, uh, fact and some uh, 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 some of my hematolymphoid colleague also use this marker to distinguish uh, uh, distinguish uh, this uh, from uh, uh, from other uh, other lymphoma in this uh, this vicinity so this was uh, about uh, uh, my the first case, uh, which was uh, a primary mediation of large B cell lymphoma, and uh, we have to keep in mind about uh, uh, the, the, uh, in this, this possibility, especially in in the young females and uh, uh, the markers of CD diffuse positive for 20, 30, and uh, uh, CD two hundred uh, clinch the diagnosis. So let's uh, move to the next case. Uh, it is a young male complaining of shortness of breath and loss of weight with a uh, with a, a low grade fever. CT scan shows a large mediastinal mass, and my, the biopsy from that is provided. So I'll again uh, take your some time so that before I go to the higher magnification. So in this biopsy, as compared to the first one, we are seeing lot of. Uh, fibrosis. So here the sclerosis and fibrosis is relatively more. They are, uh, it is also showing the infiltration by some lymphoid cells. So I'll just move you around the this biopsy core. So if you see on the low power, we are seeing mainly in the, there is a sclerotic stroma and these lymphoid cells. And uh, this area bring, uh, I like to bring your attention. You can see there are some cells which are relatively very large uh, I, I hope you can appreciate uh, them on your screens uh, as well. There are some uh, cells which are, if you compare them with the surrounding lymphoid cells, they are uh, pretty large in, in size. So uh, as uh, it is a conventional teaching, uh, uh, the, one of the common lesion, uh, which is lymphoid rich with the large cells, which is, uh, which is predominantly mononuclear. And we can see there are some halos around uh, it. Uh, uh, like a like that of a lacunar cells and these cells are quite significant in number so the, the first and foremost differential or the possibility we have to keep in mind is that of a hodgkin lymphoma and the markers for that we have to uh, this is a, just to show the 20 uh, the legion uh, cells only there are focal aggregates of of cd20 which are which are there uh, C CD3, uh, if we see the expression of CD3, 
it is relatively more and but now uh, we would like to see uh, definitely uh, like to see whether the, these large cells were positive or uh, or not uh, and uh, so these are the some of the large cells which are they, which are there in the background but they are not uh, picking up uh, the cd3 and the next marker which as expected which is uh, which is required for uh, for this case is cd30 and uh, just give me a little time so that it can slide can come to the focus you can see there are small majority of these cells were nicely picked up uh, by uh, picking up cd30 so we have a uh, impression in our mind that this is likely to be a Hodgkin lymphoma patient is young, young male uh, with the mediastinal mass and uh, some under, and and uh, some B symptoms as well. So in addition to the these uh, markers, we, we also uh, perform some additional markers like uh, this is a PAX five. You can see the the uh, B cells uh, which which are strongly positive, but as compared to the large cells. Uh, they usually show the weak expression. So Pax5 in Hodgkin will always be a weak positivity, as you can see with this uh, the the arrows which I am pointing out. So you never expect a Pax5 to be very strong uh, in a in a Hodgkin. And uh, as we know that Hodgkin is uh, considered to be associated with the with the EBV, and uh, we have done uh, EBV ISC also in this case, and. Uh, you can see this. Uh, these large cells are also positive for EBV. So this is the case of Hodgkin, and there's another new markers uh, which is being now attempted by uh, some uh, some people is a STAT six. So STAT six, which we know that uh, it used to come with a, uh, a SFT, solitary fibrous tumor. So you can see that as compared to the background cells, the Hodgkin cells are all are nicely picking up with the STAT6. So this is these are the new markers uh, which are years considered to be specific for one entity now, and uh, eventually can uh, when they are tried in other uh, other tumors, uh, they also help. So if you are stuck in a, in any case, so why I'm showing uh, these different type of markers in uh, in these first two cases, uh, because this majority of the time we deal with a very tiny. Uh, core biopsies and uh, one marker may or may not uh, give you uh, uh, conclusive answers. And uh, the problem with the Hodgkin in the mediastinum is, uh, uh, is that uh, because one thing uh, we have to make a diagnosis on the core biopsies uh, on limited material, uh, if there is a, a extensive fibrosis and crushing artifacts, your markers uh, will may or may not give you a conclusive answer. And especially if your RS cells are very uh, scanty or rare, uh, then you will always be hesitant to offer a uh, offer a diagnosis. And uh, uh, and if you are not comfortable, don't hesitate to ask for the ad additional biopsy. But any additional biopsy means it is additional uh, resources uh, which a patient need to spend, and it delays the treatment. So try to make a best uh, uh, put your best resources on the first shot and. Uh, uh, what uh, even there are some other markers which were earlier this not described to be used in the lymphomas like uh, uh, like stat six in Hodgkin lymphoma. So you can try them as as well because stat six being a nuclear marker, it it can be really uh, be very useful. Uh, so let's move to uh, third case. Uh, so uh, this uh, although there is a very long history, I'll just uh, summarize the history for you. This is a, there is a long, a la, a young male, uh, male with the young male uh, with the uh, no comorbidity and addictions, and uh, uh, PET scan uh, reveal. Uh, PET scan reveal uh, a large mass uh, with the high SUV, and uh, these are the images from the from the PET scan. Which can which you can appreciate there is large mediastinal mass with the high uptake and uh, the biopsy from the mass was done and this case was also was uh, di diagnosed as a small cell carcinoma although it was a young patient it was uh, reported as small cell carcinoma from uh, from uh, from one of the outside center and uh, 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 on FNAC smears uh, so the, we we got the biopsy of this uh, this case. 
which was done in in Tata Hospital, and these are the biopsy images, uh, and you can appreciate the when uh, I first look at it, look at it, the uh, the first thing I notice is are these pink areas, which are um, nothing but uh, the granulomas. So the initial, but at along with these granulomas, there are some areas uh, which is which is showing some large atypical cells, as you can appreciate uh, in these areas there are cells which are quite cohesive okay so they are not dispersed like the uh, the earlier earlier cases they are quite cohesive packed uh, and they have abundant cytoplasm as well as you can appreciate these areas have a vacuolated uh, cytoplasm which is quite abundant uh, in these areas so uh, what thought process uh, will come to your mind uh, is it uh, uh, a carcinoma or is it uh, something else so and you we have to specially uh, take into account the history of this patient especially the age he's a young uh, young male patient and even uh, there are some other areas also which can show you the exist coexisting granulomas and these large atypical cells and uh, so <clears throat> initial thoughts were uh, is it epithelial tumors or uh, but the cytokinetins uh, was negative in this uh, but this is the one marker which is uh, which has helped us to clinch the diagnosis and that is uh, uh, stat 6 and it was we have done it upfront uh, why because it is considering in a young age we have to think about the mediastinal germ cell uh, tumor as a as a first possibility and uh, so the Stat six was uh, was positive, and this is another marker which is uh, which we did is is a OCT three four, and uh, so this is a these two markers helps to establish that this is a seminoma. We also try to look is it showing any other component germ cell tumor component uh, means is is it a uh, is, is there any seminoma or embryonal cell component? Uh, but it was not there in this this particular case. So. Uh, see both CD34, uh, CD30, and uh, uh, glepican 3 was negative uh, because uh, why? Because primary mediastinal seminoma, uh, uh, they usually uh, the uh, germ cell tumor mediastinum they are uh, mixed and uh, pure seminoma are quite uh, uh, quite rare uh, as compared to the uh, mixed tumors or non seminomatous germ cell uh, tumor. So uh, after this, uh, the di diagnostic confirmation of the malignancy uh, uh, of uh, uh, diagnosis of a germ cell tumor, the patient received a chemotherapy, and uh, the, as you can see, the mass was uh, has sh shrunken uh, significantly, and uh, we uh, we were lucky enough to get the resection specimen of uh, from this this patient. So you can appreciate here uh, there is a, some a native thymic tissue towards the periphery, and uh, the majority of the now uh, the tumor uh, which was excised it is uh, it is fibrosed uh, are, and, and hardly there are there are very focal areas uh, which uh, which were either showing these vascular proliferations or there are some cellular areas like this. I'll just uh, come, come and show you these areas in a high magnification. So these are the areas which are epithelial. Uh, they are quite uh, looking atypical uh, as, and you can appreciate. So in a known case, you will expect that uh, this might be uh, some residual germ cell tumor and uh, uh, which slightly looking slightly different from the, from the seminoma. Uh, so uh, the, the thought process in your mind will be is, it, it might be an embryonal carcinoma which which was missed on the init initial biopsy. So uh, that was the one area, and uh, I'll show you another section. But uh, at the surrounding majority of the the area is, is showing also showing large areas of necrosis, as you can appreciate here. So these are the areas of necrosis, and uh, some of these areas with the uh, with the vascular pro uh, vascular proliferation, some native uh, peripheral uh, uh, with thymic tissue compressed thymic tissue, and uh, there were some areas where there is a 
some mesenchymal proliferation was there in the nodular uh, formation which uh, you are not very sure uh, what what is happening in these these areas because is it a uh, part of the response or is it a part of the of the tumor but it was uh, it was definitely different from the from the areas which i showed you in the in the first slide which were quite uh, pleomorphic and and uh, high grade okay so let's uh, move on to the iscs in this case as uh, we initially thought that uh, that the area which is looking very large atypical they the, the that could be possibly an embryonal carcinoma component of the of the tumor and uh, these are the areas of the of the tumor which is uh, negative for cd30 so it this that means it is unlikely to be a, a, a embryonal carcinoma uh, we also did the iscs for uh, for cytokeratin uh, cell 4 and other germ cell tumor marker those were also negative in whole of the tumor so and uh, interestingly this area which is uh, which i showed you in the first uh, image it is very nicely and strongly positive for uh, for cd31 which is one of the vascular um, marker and uh, we also we reconfirmed that the the lineage of these cells to be of the vascular origin by uh, performing the ERG. So, uh, ERG and CD31 both were positive uh, in this case. So, is, so uh, that is uh, one part of the story that we, we thought that it can be, is it a somatic malignancy uh, in the form of uh, angiosarcoma in a, in a known case of germ cell tumor. Uh, but just to summarize uh, these uh, the findings. Uh, so, so there are uh, large areas of vascular proliferation with multiple nodular patterns also uh, in addition to those uh, highly pleomorphic uh, uh, areas and there are extensive therapy related uh, changes in the form of homeostiocyte, necrosis, inflammation and, and uh, cholesterol clefts. So then uh, we did a little uh, literature search because this tumor morphology was not uh, completely uh, fitting uh, uh, with what is, is expected. So, and we came across this entity that is a vasculogenic mesenchymal tumor, and it is a, a particular a specific entity which is described by, especially in the mediastinal, uh, mediastinal tumor, and it is considered to be a as a precursor of uh, angiosarcoma. So if, if you see uh, from, uh, these are the pictures from this article. So these uh, tumors, especially in the post chemotherapy and uh, patients who have a, uh, a yolk sac tumor component, uh, uh, they, they show these, uh, these changes more frequently as per this uh, paper. So you can see there are a lot of vascular proliferations, which may, we may ignore them either as a part of, of the therapy response or uh, therapeutic response. So this uh, Levy et al. They have described these uh, tumors as a vasculogenic uh, tumor, and uh, they can be either uh, they categorize into three main categories based purely on uh, morphology. They can uh, be either teratoma with vasculogenic stroma, or vasculogenic mesenchymal tumors, which uh, can be uh, either low grade or high grade. We are seeing in this particular case, it is uh, quite a high grade and consistent with a uh, with the ang angiosarcoma. So uh, this was a case, uh, and these uh, VMT tumors uh, they can show the loss uh, of uh, 12p uh, heterogeneity, and there is an association of uh, these tumors with other somatic malignancy as well as the hematological malignancy as well. So, uh, especially in a germ cell tumor, in a post-resection specimen, I recommend you, you should keep this possibility of a uh, vasculogenic mesenchymal tumor, uh, especially if you see a lot of vascular proliferation, which is forming a nodule uh, and a nodular configuration. So, we have called this uh, case as a vasculogenic mesenchymal tumor with angiosarcomatous transformation in a known case of mediastinal germ cell, uh, cell tumor. And uh, we uh, have uh, uh, have a good collection of mediastinal germ cell tumor, and we have published our experience uh, of the same also. And um, in, especially in our uh, data, we found there is a very high prevalence of uh, uh, somatic malignancy in the mediastinal germ cell tumor, which was not described in other uh, other sites of or, or gonadal uh, germ cell tumors. So around 10% of the cases shows uh, some form of, of somatic malignancy, which was quite unique. And at that time, when we published this paper, we were not uh, uh, aware of uh, this vasculogenic, vasculogenic mesenchymal tumor. So maybe in future, 
uh, 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 we will be able to appreciate or identify these lesions uh, more precisely. And just to show one another case of mediastinal germ cell tumor, and here you can see this is a case of a germ cell tumor, and it is looking like a placent, uh, absolutely like a placenta. So it is like a, a placental transmorgification of a, we we can see. So these such sort of vascular changes you might uh, see. Uh, I don't know whether these are uh, whether it is related to the, some of the therapeutic drugs which is called causing so many so much uh, vascular proliferation, especially in the in in these mediastinal tumors, or is it uh, re related to the uh, germ cell nature of uh, of these tumors to have uh, this unique uh, changes? So this was uh, uh, about uh, this case of a germ cell tumor which has shown uh, an angiosarcomatous transformation as second mal uh, somatic malignancy and in the background we have a vasculogenic mesenchymal transformation. Uh, so let's move to another case uh, which is a large uh, 48 year old male with the anterior mediastinal mass which is measuring around 30 centimeters. So you can uh, imagine uh, it, uh, this is a huge mass and these are the gross images. It appears as a lobulated uh, mass with some fleshy areas and, uh, uh, and yellowish uh, uh, discoloration. We can, and uh, uh, there are no necrosis or hemorrhage uh, uh, in any of these, uh, these sections. And when we saw the sections, so, so this uh, tumor appear to be rich in the uh, adipocytes, so uh, and they look quite mature uh, uh, ad adipocytes. So is it? Uh, but we don't expect uh, such a large tumor uh, occupying the mediastinum and uh, which is uh, with of a f which is rich in 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 a, in a fat. Uh, and uh, if we see very uh, more closely these tumors, we were able to appreciate there are some lipoblast like uh, cells also present. So morphologically, we thought it is a, it is a, a liposarcoma, which is uh, which is showing the presence of these few atypical uh, lipos, uh, 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 lipo, uh, lipoblast like cells. But in addition, there are some areas which have, you can appreciate these areas which are more cellular. And then the concerns start coming. Is it uh, only a liposarcoma or is it uh, uh, some de-differentiated component? Uh, but these uh, these cellular, some cellular spindle cell areas, they were quite intermixed uh, uh, with the adipocytic uh, cytic areas, and uh, and these areas was were predominantly from the uh, from the area which on grossly which appears more fleshy and and, and fibrous, uh, but uh, none of the we, we sampled it extensively, but uh, in none of the sections we could identify any uh, any high grade transformation or uh, and these. Uh, some of these areas were quite close to the to the to the large blood vessels, so we thought it is uh, most likely it, it is a, a reactive uh, process rather than uh, a de-differentiated uh, process in a in a liposarcoma. And uh, we uh, confirmed the diagnosis of liposarcoma just for the completion sake. Uh, M MDM two and uh, uh, and P sixteen was done, which was uh, which was positive. Uh, so this was a case of a large mediastinal liposarcoma, and this is a P16 ISC, which can nicely you can see nicely uh, uh, these these all these cells which which are uh, lipoblasts are are picked up uh, by 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 P16. So although in mediastinum liposarcomas are quite rare, uh, but you some you might encounter. Uh, th these cases rarely and uh, imaging wise uh, many of many times the radiologists say that uh, this lesion is likely to be either teratoma or uh, uh, but a smart radiologist can pick up uh, uh, these lesions preoperatively uh, but uh, these uh, these cases if you don't think about the uh, uh, liposarcoma or, or uh, adipocytic tumors in the mediastinum you can uh, confuse these uh, these biopsies to be non-representative uh, because many times you might see only mature cells, and uh, we have around uh, ten to twelve cases of mediastinal lipo uh, liposarcomas, and uh, majority of them were uh, were either well differentiated. A uh, few uh, few of them had shown uh, the myxoid degeneration, and two were uh, uh, pleomorphic, and only one case uh, show the uh, show the de differentiation. So the surgery is the treatment of choice in these uh, these these cases, and they uh, if it is completely resected out, 
these patients uh, perform uh, quite quite well especially uh, if it is a, a well differentiated liposarcomas but uh, as expected in other side pleomorphic ones are the one uh, which don't don't behave uh, and need adjuvant therapy so uh, th let's move to the another case now uh, uh, shifting gears from the mesenchymal tumor to some other entities in the me mediastinum 70 year old male uh, with the uh, cuff and uh, cuff dyspnea and hemoptysis and ct scan shows a large large mass which is also infiltrating the lung parenchyma and uh, so again we have to deal with the core biopsies uh, so this is a, a, another example of a core biopsy just uh, give me a little time so you can see again there is a now again there is a some very cellular tumor with uh, few areas of uh, few uh, there are many uh, large areas of necrosis as you can appreciate these are the areas of necrosis and we have a tumor which is quite monotonous which is arranged in diffuse sheet and then our range of, uh, if you see the morphology, so our range of differentials, uh, it, it ranges from the carcinoma to only differential carcinoma to lymphoma to sarcomas. So it can be anything, and uh, we definitely need uh, some panel of ISCs in in this case to resolve these. Uh, one one interesting thing uh, which was appreciated is that some of the areas uh, these cells have some plasma satoid uh, appearance or rhabdoid morphology. I I don't know whether you can appreciate, but if you focus on these area around my uh, mouse cursor, uh, you can appreciate these some of these cells have uh, these uh, rhabdoid like appearance. Uh, so, uh, but is it uh, helping us to clinch a diagnosis or uh, the, is it a case which Dr. Dupti showed? Is it a plasma plastic lymphoma? Because those are the things which we keep in mind in, uh, in when we see the uh, mediastinal biopsy because that is the that can be a, one of the common. This is another section which is also sh sh again showing these similar looking monotonous cells with large with areas of necrosis. So we started with the with cytokeratin uh, in this case, and uh, uh, cytokeratin was very focally positive. Uh, but after set cytokeratin, nothing, um, none of the other marker helped us. Uh, so, so so all the epithelial markers were negative. Broad uh, broad lymphoma markers were negative. So uh, then uh, we thought, although this patient is elderly, let's try uh, some germ cell marker as a cell four. So this is a cell four ISC, which is done in this case. And a cell four ISC is, uh, cell four is a nuclear marker, which is positive in quite a uh, good number of cells. You can see the, the, all these cells are showing the nuclear positivity for cell four. Uh, we tried, some additional uh, marker for germ cell, it was quite high grade, uh, CD30 was negative. Then again, uh, we are struck, uh, is it some aberrant expression of cell four? And uh, someone suggested, let's uh, also try some vascular marker. So, and the CD34 came, uh, also came very strongly positive. So, uh, so after doing these three, uh, the uh, wide panel of ISCs, we were, not getting a very clear cut answer. And uh, I was convinced that this tumor is something unique, uh, which uh, we are missing. Um, and we should not leave it like that because now earlier we thought it is showing focal cytokeratin expression, uh, uh, but then cell four also came positive. CD34 has nicely highlighted and you can't ignore so much CD34. Uh, but the other vascular markers like ERG, CD31, um, they were negative. And then uh, we throw another marker, which is this marker. And you can appreciate now that uh, there are some small cells or the lymphoid cells in the background, which are positive. And uh, 
So this tumor is negative for this marker. So and this marker is a this is a BRG1, and uh, so this is a case of a SMARC A4 deficient uh, tumor, and uh, so it is a very distinct entity in the new WHO and the thymic and lung and the and the mediastinum can be the the is the common site for it. So this is a, like a, a, a SMARC A4 deficient undifferentiated carcinoma, which shows the loss of of SMARC A4, and these tumors are considered to be very very aggressive and uh, as per the who the diagnostic criteria for them is the uh, loss of uh, the tumor cells which are uh, arranged in the diffuse sheets with the discoesive sheets uh, and uh, showing some rhabdoid uh, morphology uh, or uh, and isc there is a loss of smart a4 that is one of the essential diagnostic criteria and this our case um, not only meet the essential criteria, but also meet the desirable criteria, like there is a, uh, also expression for CD34 and cell 4 in this particular case, which help us to uh, clinch the, uh, the diagnosis in, in this, ca this case. Just to share one another example of a, uh, just one second. Yeah, so there's another example of a, a, a similar uh, tumor, but with a distinct, a different, little different morphology. As uh, you can see, uh, this case, uh, as compared to the previous one, which was uh, quite discohesive, here there's some attempt to form some cords uh, or aggregate, but the stroma is quite uh, mixoid. You can appreciate that the stroma is a, has a mixoid appearance and there are some rhabdoid like cells here also as we saw in the in the in the earlier case so with we were little smart uh, um, with the with the uh, with the knowledge of previous case and in this case also despite uh, even putting lot of markers again cytokeratin was very focally positive uh, which was not very convincing to offer a diagnosis a conclusive diagnosis, uh, but when we did the SMARC K, uh, I9 or BRG4 ISC in this case, this case also sh showed the loss of BRG expression. So, so these are the uh, newly described tumors, and uh, if you are struck with a with it with with a diagnosis where it is not leading you to any anywhere, please do consider the possibility of of uh, this diagnostic entity in your differential and. Uh, the 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 diagnosis can be established by doing uh, these uh, this uh, simple ISC that is a BRG one on these these cases. Okay, now let's go on to the next case, which is a young uh, female with a large hilar mass. So most of the cases has will have a similar uh, sort of more, uh, history, and uh, so now this is a young patient. Uh, Again, showing these tissue cores. So now what we are seeing here, it is showing again a tumor with some areas of fibrosis. And this is the area where I will stop for some time. And you can appreciate uh, if you ask uh, what, are the, what are these areas. So these uh, areas have slight some more cytoplasm, they are uh, having squamide appearance and in the surrounding there are surrounded by these nest of cells which are relatively monotonous and you can again see uh, why these some cells with, uh, with slightly little more cytoplasm is, is coming up again and again in these within these nests. Otherwise, the tumor is looking relatively <clears throat> monotonous to us. So this is again, uh, that means we are dealing with some unique tumor again. And uh, we did a basic ISCs and uh, this tumor showed a strong and diffuse positivity for, uh, for P40. And uh, so, uh, so are we dealing with a squamous carcinoma? But this is a young patient, female patient, which is just 25 year old. And... Uh, so offering a diagnosis of squamous carcinoma in a young patient, uh, we have, uh, and even the small cell carcinoma in a young patient, we have to be very uh, careful. And uh, besides this uh, P40 uh, expression, uh, none of the other markers were uh, 
what they uh, uh, were conclusive on but the, the the key feature in this case was uh, which is uh, which is forcing us uh, which, which are very highlight of this case was uh, these ab foci of abrupt uh, squamoid differentiation or characterization which is very peculiar of uh, uh, nut carcinoma and this is a uh, nut ihc i'll just before i go to actual isc i'll just show you oh, okay sorry okay so it's, in this case there is a no con control is not there so this is a nut iscs uh, and uh, if you can uh, you can appreciate this that the expression of this nut isc is like a nuclear uh, speckle like a ex positivity which is called it like it is like a salt uh, uh, papers on on the uh, are thrown on on the on the nucleus of uh, of these cells so this is a case of a nut carcinoma uh, which is uh, 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 seen in the young female this is an, another case uh, of uh, in the similar lines uh, as you uh, we have seen in the first case uh, here also there are cells which are relatively monotonous but and uh, these cells have slightly more cytoplasm as compared to the the, the first one there are uh, in this particular case there are no areas where we are seeing the uh, the keratinizations the type of keratinization which was seen in in first case uh, but the the at nuclear atp is very very minimal in uh, throughout the, uh, the the biopsy core and this patient was also again uh, a young patient and when we did the isc for uh, in in this case also it came was strong and diffuse positive for p40 and uh, the nut uh, uh, p40 and this is the uh, just for completion we did uh, ttf1 which is negative because uh, uh, this mass was also going to the mediastinum and this is the this is the just uh, to show uh, for nut isc uh, the control which is used is a uh, is is a testicular tissue which is used so the uh, the the uh, certain cells they, they are neg negative but the, uh, the the germ cells uh, they uh, they are highlighted by the by the this nut antibody so this particular case was also again a, a case of a nut carcinoma but it has a distinct morphology both of these cases uh, shows uh, uh, expression for nut and p40 but uh, it has a uh, 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 the nut and p40 was was positive in, in both the, these cases and uh, let me just quickly show you another case of in of similar type so as now you can see this this case is a again have a quite monotonous population of cells which is throughout it is showing similar uh, similar morphology without any uh, areas of abrupt characterization here the uh, another unique feature is you can see there are many neutrophils also within these uh, these areas and uh, if you see uh, the iscs in this case uh the first i'll show you the cytokeratin it is cytokeratin is coming very focally so you can see there are only very few areas where the cytokeratin is is positive and uh, even sorry this is not yeah so even the p40 is also very patchy so as compared to the first two cases we are the we are seeing the diffuse positivity for p40 uh, or p63 it was very patchy and again the nut isc was very strong and uh, and diffuse nice uh, spectral positivity is being appreciated so what are uh, so these are the three cases where uh, we can see the distinct morphology of a, of a nut carcinoma and uh, you have to keep this uh, this diagnosis in mind especially in a young uh, young female uh, young patients which shows the monotonous population of the uh, population of of the similar looking cells so this was a just a second
Okay. Yeah. So this was a case of uh, nut carcinoma and the uh, ISC is although is a, is a diagnostic, but uh, if, if you want the, it, it, the nut BRD4 is gene rearrangement uh, by fish uh, is, is the characteristic of, of this, this particular tumor. Another uh, important thing about this, uh, this entity uh, is just a second, it's taking a little time to come up. Uh, I'm sorry, I think my computer, it's hanged up. Uh, how much time we I have? So I just want to say, emphasize on this uh, case, uh, because nut carcinoma can, uh, especially of the lung and mediastinum, they can be negative for, uh, negative for P40 and uh, uh, P, uh, P40, or they can show the focal expression for the, for these markers. So in these cases, you have to be a little more careful uh, and uh, as as nut immunohistochemistry can be uh, can be negative oh, sorry oh, sorry p40 isc can be negative in in these cases and uh, uh, if you don't do the nut isc you, you might miss uh, some of the of these cases uh, how much time we i have i have two three more cases also uh, 15 minutes sir Okay, uh, sorry, there, I think there is some issue with the projection. Uh, earlier, you were able to see it uh, clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Should I uh, stop sharing and reshare it? Is it? Is it okay with you? I think it's better because it's not coming. So you can stop it and reshare. Yeah, just give me a second. Can you see it, sir, now? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yeah, apologies from my end. So, uh, 
so as uh, as i was mentioning about the nut carcinoma uh, so you can get a p40 uh, negative or cytokinin even also weak so in it, so it is recommended that uh, p63 is, uh, so these cases usually express p63 as compared to the p40 because of p, uh, p40 is is a marker which is of more differentiated uh, tumors so uh, so that was about the story about the about the nut let's move to next case now 63 year old male uh, with the history of hemoptysis and uh, lung mass uh, sorry okay i just skip this so 67 year old gentleman uh, with the he's a smoker and ct scan shows a of the thorax revealed a well encapsulated mass which is uh, around 3 cm and patient also has a raised uh, uh, is uh, uh, antibody levels and uh, so the diagnosis uh, they thought about it is a thymoma with the uh, mycenia gravis and uh, this is the radiology image you can see there is a very well circumscribed uh, lesion which is pointed out by this uh, this arrow with some cystic component uh, on it and the patient underwent radical thym thymectomy with the with plasma pheresis cover uh, was done and these are the gross images you can see there is a very well circumscribed uh, lesion and we can appreciate there is a some normal thymic tissue towards the the periphery and there is a circumscribed uh, uh, tumor which is which is very well uh, circumscribed nodules and uh, uh, these tumor, the tumors is composed of uh, two types of, of cells, which majority of them has a mucinous, uh, uh, many of them has a mucinous component, which is highlighted by the special stains for the, for the mucic armine. And uh, also there are some of the cells are showing, uh, uh, showing uh, the squamide differentiation. So this is the IC for CK7 and P63. I think it is not coming up uh, nicely on this uh, image. So this was a case of a mucopetromide carcinoma of thymus of, uh, presenting with the myasthenia gravis. And although thymic mucopetromide carcinomas, they are rare. Uh, and uh, even I have also uh, seen only two cases of thymic uh, mucopetromide carcinoma uh, till now. And uh, this was an, another case which we saw around five, six years back. And uh, both of these tumors were uh, intermediate grade uh, mucopetromide carcinoma and this tumor was predominantly cystic uh, as you can appreciate on, on the gross uh, examination of the, this, this case and uh, as compared to the other one which was uniformly solid and uh, the, the, the morphology, uh, the identification of this tumor um, once you, uh, it, it, uh, on resection it is relatively easy uh, but sometimes on the biopsy specimen because we never think about the mucopetromide carcinoma especially in the, in the media stem so it can be challenging on biopsy if you don't think about uh, this entity in the media stem. So uh, just uh, quickly coming to the, one of the, my last cases, uh, this is the around a 45 year old male with anterior mediastinal mass with the uptake on the on the dota pad and uh, this is the tumor which is again quite uh, quite uh, composed of quite monotonous looking cells and here also you can appreciate some of these cells have a plasma sotoid uh, appearance so I just uh, put it put this case uh, after the discussion because many of many people has a, uh, has a queries related to the tumor which are appearing after my first talk uh, which, about the tumor which are relatively monotonous and uh, have high mitotic. So these are uh, uh, some of the mitosis. Uh, at least in this field, there are uh, one, two, and three mito mitosis. I can I can see. So this tumor has a, a nested pattern and uh, quite monotonous uh, looking cells. And uh, this is a synaptophysin uh, stain. So that means it these all these cells uh, are of neuroendocrine origin. And uh, I'll just quickly go. This is a chromogranin, which is also established is supporting the neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, the main thing which I like 
this let's keep this marker so yeah so this i would like to focus you on this stain uh, which is a ki67 so th this is the problem which even some of you have asked uh, the questions about the, the neuroendocrine tumor which shows uh, which are differentiated but with the high mitosis and uh, uh, proliferation how to address uh, or uh, address or give the diagnosis in these cases so this ki67 is quite uh, high uh, what we expect in a, a typical carcinoid so there are no areas of necrosis in this case but uh, mitosis and uh, and ks proliferation was quite significant and and morphologically it was a uh, it was a, uh, like that of a well differentiated neuroendocrine uh, tumor so uh, this is a case of a carcinoid with elevated mit mitotic count or the ki67 uh, proliferation and as i mentioned in my first talk also that you have to give uh, this whenever you come across such case uh, if you can do molecular or p53 or retinoblastoma it it is well and good but uh, if it is not available then you should give a uh, rider that uh, this uh, tumor has high proliferation and it is it can it is likely to behave more aggressively so that they can take a, a treatment uh, uh, call depending on on that so uh, with these uh, couple of cases, I'd like to uh, conclude that mediastinum, uh, it is a site for heterogeneous group of, uh, of tumors and diagnosis on the small core biopsies can be really very challenging. And each case uh, is, uh, is different and uh, uh, you have to struggle uh, many times, if, uh, uh, especially for these un unconventional uh, cases. But most majority of the cases or run of the mill cases are thymic epithelial tumors. And Dr. Drupti has nicely uh, told, uh, illustrated you uh, uh, how to distinguish or the, what is the diagnostic approach you should adopt uh, when you're dealing with a thymic epithelial tumor. So my, uh, I, how I see when I see a thymoma, uh, is it uh, epithelial rich or lymphoid rich? Is, if it is epithelial rich, your differentials are type A thymoma or B3. If it is a lymphoid rich, then it is either B1 or B2. Uh, or B2 thymoma. And if it is uh, it is quite pleomorphic within in infiltrative edges, then it is likely to be a thymic carcinoma. So other uh, other than these uh, common epithelial tumors, uh, the cases which I showed, they are rare, but you might encounter them uh, in once in a, your lifetime. So with this, I end my talk and sorry for the some technical glitch uh, in between and uh, you have to wait uh, a little longer for that. And if there are any queries or any questions, I will be happy to, to happy to take them. It was an excellent talk, Dr. Rajiv. I have taken care to include many diverse cases, many newer entities and also rare entities in your talk. And also you have introduced us to the newer IUC markers. Thank you very much. I think you have a, we have a few questions. We'll take a few of them. Yeah, sure, ma'am. So I hope the, the relay uh, was okay for the digital cases because uh, that is sometime it can be a little uh, challenging. It was good and clear. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Now in our IAPM also, we have started using digital slides. Yes. So everybody might have been become familiar with this. Yeah, yeah, because they give the more uh, uh, realistic picture of a, of a case and you can... Uh, get en en engaged with the case uh, as you are doing, uh, as you are sitting on a microscope. Yes. The first one, first question is, what will you advise on limited biopsy material and IHC panel? Yeah, so if uh, we have very uh, limited material and so uh, the, uh, for the first case, I'll, uh, because it was showing quite monotonous uh, uh, sheets of, of the cells. So PMBCL will definitely will, will be my first differential. So CD20, CD30, those are two essential markers. And if you can, uh, if you have uh, available 23 or 200, CD200, uh, that is, a, but minimum 20 and uh, uh, CD20 and CD30, they are the essential ones. Thank you. Next question is lipomatous assisted like areas in a differentiated liposarcoma. What is your opinion and experience on this? 
ma'am can you can you repeat a uh, question lipomatous esophageal area cd differentiated liposarcoma what is your opinion and experience on this can this scenario lead to diagnostic difficulty yeah i agree and even in, uh, uh, even in this uh, particular case there were some focal areas which are, have sft like uh, appearance uh, and uh, uh, so i was also doubtful whether this this is it a sft like a differentiation or not uh, but i completely agree that is a very rare diagnosis and uh, if you uh, you have a characteristic a discrete areas like in this case there were some areas which were showing some uh, sorry form like pattern but they were intermixed with it, within the uh, the adiposity component so in those situations you can uh, uh, you, you can uh, it, it can be part of some reactive uh, proliferation rather than the true de differentiation so for true de differentiation distinct area if it is there uh then it is uh, you can call it uh, earlier it was presumed that only the high grade de de differentiation should be mentioned but uh, now there are is enough data which shows any sort of de de differentiation either it is a low grade or a high grade should be should be documented the next question is about the thickness of the sections is that what microns do you advise it for a crushed tissue uh we uh, i have not tried uh, cutting a crushed biopsy uh, on a different uh, thing a uh, different micro so i am not i will not be the right person to answer this question or uh, if uh, the person who has asked if if they have their uh, experience uh, if they cut it out at uh, low uh, low micron thickness and whether it really help them because you crushed biopsy do maximum isc markers yeah yeah that, that's true uh, you can you could but uh, for isc we have to cut it at 2 uh, to 3 micron not uh, not more than that so so uh, but if for morphology whether it really help to if, in a crushed biopsy i i have not tried that I, so i next time a crushed biopsy come i will try to cut it at uh, lower thickness and any experience from your end ma'am on especially on the uh, pertaining to this question Okay, I think Dr. Ani wants to talk about that. Answer that question, Ani. No, ma'am. I was just uh, cancelling out all the questions. Okay, so can we go to the next question? That is, if it histologically looks like neuroendocrine carcinoma with focal synaptophysic positivity and focal patchy PFOT, can we call mixed set? no a focal uh, p40 expression can be seen in uh, many tumors and even adenocarcinoma so based on focal uh, p40 expression we should not call it as a combined carcinoma so we have to see a uh, distinct areas and uh, patchy expression of p40 is very deceptive so you should not make so the expression of p40 first thing it is has to be strong and diffuse uh to make a conclusive diagnosis patchy mm -hmm. staining uh, or focal staining based only on the staining you should not make uh, you should not call it as a mixed carcinoma let me take okay. a few more questions yeah yeah it's we can take in the case of atypical carcinoid by morphology and mitosis according to who but only case when being discordant what is the terminology they were put in the same umbrella so they 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 have seen either increased mitosis or increased proliferation so they okay that was discussed in the talk already yeah so okay. most likely in the next who we expect uh, to get a, a more clear vision on that it's, can we distinguish nodular lymphohistiocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma versus T cell rich B cell lymphoma yeah i think this question was uh, okay. asked earlier also and uh, the next is, question also relates to that yeah but uh, nlphl especially in the mediastinum it is itself is a uh, quite rare uh, diagnosis and so nlphl usually uh, they are either a, mostly present as a, a either as a axillary node or uh, inguinal uh, swelling uh, i have limited uh, experience on on this uh, as uh, i am not a lymphoma uh, person uh, so maybe you can uh, question some lymphoma expert for this okay. next one also we can leave it is on about grass on lymphomas 
Yeah, so gray zone lymphomas uh, uh, in the mediastinum, they are uh, definitely there because even uh, the CD20, uh, CD20 uh, positivity uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mediastinal Hodgkin lymphoma, that is also uh, very well, well known. So and, and many times it can be very strong expression. So even for the Hodgkin lymphoma versus uh, large B-cell lymphoma with scattered uh, or iso isolated uh, B cells, that can be a, uh, a tricky, uh, tricky problem. And uh, so those are the the established uh, issues, uh, especially in the core biopsies in the mediastinal region. Uh, and uh, so, but with the new markers which are coming, like the one I showed, like uh, STAT six and those uh, even GATA three, also people, some people are, are, are uh, try for the Hodgkin. So these markers really. Uh, help to distinguish one uh, from the other. But there are some cases which will not give you uh, answers because tumor don't read the books and some things will always remain in the gray, gray zone. Are they only in context of media staining lesions? That is what we want to know. Yeah, so major problem is uh, between uh, uh, mediastinal Hodgkin uh, versus uh, B cell, uh, large B cell lymphomas because there is an overlap of the markers. Uh, so th that is what uh, is particularly uh, mentioned uh, in the in the mediastinal region. So the the clue to reduce the gray zone lymphoma is uh, you have to go with the more and additional ISCs. Uh, then only you you, you can uh, give a more precise diagnosis. So if we if we remain if we restrict only to twenty or thirty, we might end up calling. And especially if the if these RS-like cells they are uh, uh, quite abundant, so in, in those cases uh, you can fall in the trap. Thank you very much, Dr. Raji. I think the questions have ended. Thank you for patiently answering all these questions at this late time. Thank you. Thank much. you, Raji, for uh, two sessions you are taken with a one-hour uh, interval, right? See, very SOT session, but I like uh, the digital uh, imaging and all that. It's very crisp, no problem. Thank you. Thank there is not much. In, in between, there is, uh, I think, your computer got hanged. Huh? Yeah, yeah. There, there was, that's why I need to stop there. Uh, so, two excellent yeah. sessions. And Tripti is there. I, she's here. Yes, right? sir. She's there. Okay. She's there. She's there. I'm there. Yeah. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Tripti, as well as Rajiv. For this wonderful session so this is the end of the first day session of the webinar and tomorrow we will have three more sessions uh, common sessions one is mucosal biopsies then go by the granulomatous lesion and uh, the last one is interstitial lung diseases so we sh start sharp at 6 30. thank you once again the speakers and the moderators and, thank you, uh, thank you, Resident Dr. Annie, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, and good night. And yeah. thank you, everybody, and uh, good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we can wind up today's session. Okay. Shama, I, oh yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Okay, okay, I don't bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. bye, -bye.